Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten, the show where five DMs take on D&D's top gothic horror campaign. I'm Dragna Carta, your host and DM, and thank you all for being here. Uh, unfortunately, before we get started, uh, it is my privilege to share with you that after the uh, leak of the upcoming uh, D&D 5e sourcebooks, um, I believe one of them that is coming up is about a magic school, so unfortunately, Twice Bitten is cancelled. This is now a shitty ripoff of Harry Potter. So I need to hear what everyone's uh, student uh, characters are going to be for this new campaign. Earthwind year, but 50 years ago. What? Well, it's 20 Force years though? later. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Serena, you sound bewildered. Yeah, I, I didn't hear about any of this. So I guess Kiva's going to be um, the the jock, <laughs> the, the gay jock um, who plays field hockey, which is just what I was. In does she have a leather jacket? Yes, yeah, she does. Very good. What about Amity? Uh, and uh, Crow is going to be a uh, Slytherin who should have been in Gryffindor. He's really powerful, so all the teachers are scared of him. <laughs> oh, no. Actually, I'm going to be Darkness Dementia, Ebony Ravenway, and uh, I expect you to memorize that name. Screw it. This campaign's canceled. We're going back to Curse of Strahd. No! What with oh, the vampires? Really? Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Jack can go. There we are. Jack has abdicated and I'm seizing this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, our, it looks like our, our Hogwarts shitty ripoff adventure will have to wait another day. Uh, so let's get started then with Curse of Straw twice bitten. And welcome back. So, last we left off on Twice Bitten. At the invitation of a mysterious note, Lulison met Strahd von Zarevich, the vampiric lord of Barovia, at a secret meeting in the coffin maker's shop of Velaki. There, Strahd offered her the secrets of vampirism, at the cost of her continued discretion and her role as an informant on her friend's activities. Returning to the Blue Water Inn, Willison revealed the details of her conversation under interrogation, agreeing that any relationship with Strahd was dangerous, but that the line of communication it contained presented a new opportunity to use her reports for their own ends. And so, as Willison sent her first report to Castle Ravenloft, her companions turned in for the night's rest, as Metreon and Amity dreamed from their cramped bedrolls in the inn. Metron's dream, however, swiftly turned to nightmare as the wounded one, his patron, collected the last of his reports and threatened to devour his soul. Yet Metreon was saved by the appearance of Father Lucian's spirit who seemed to banish the wounded one's presence. After reconciling, the two were greeted by Metreon's true savior, Calcadra, a powerful angel who offered Metreon an investiture of celestial power in exchange for his efforts to defeat Strahd and free certain beings trapped within the mists, an offer with Met which Metreon gladly accepted. Meanwhile, Amity dreamt of a silent knight atop a white dais amidst the battlefield of bones and a silver-white draconic spirit that asked her to free some knights from their prisons. After awakening the next morning, the companion spoke with Davian Mardikov, 
returning to him the enchanted gem they had recovered from Yester Hill and, with surprising ease, recruiting him to their fight against Strahd. Kiva revealed the Sun Sword to the Mardukov family at large and learned that the holy symbol they sought was likely the holy symbol of Ravenkind, a powerful artifact once used by a legendary paladin to root out and destroy vampires. After receiving a payment of gold from Baroness Vokter for their efforts to eliminate the vampiric threat, the group set off on the road to Argonvastolt. As they explored its dusty halls and lurking secrets, they soon encountered a familiar saber-toothed tiger and its owner, the vampire hunter Dr. Rudolf van Richten, who had decided to lay low in Argonvastolt while preparing his next move. After learning that the mansion seemed to contain several undead creatures that van Richten had thus far refrained from disturbing, the companions moved to depart until Lillison reminded Esmeralda of a question she had once mentioned she had had for the old vampire hunter. In doing so, Esmeralda stepped forward, challenging Van Richten and demanding that he justify a journal entry that she had once found amidst the burned remnants of his notes. And so. As you stand in the ruins of the wrecked parlor amidst the old draconic mansion, you see through the shaded windows faint flickers of mist curling across the landscape, dim gray light filtering through what places they can find amidst the tattered fabrics. You can see here beneath the dusty cobweb-ridden furnishings, the damaged chandelier and the faded mural that paints the ceiling overhead the figure of Van Richten, his eyes stony as he looks toward Esmeralda, who stands by the door. Her lip curled, Esmeralda pulls into her long coat, taking from one of the many pockets on the inside a small bit of parchment, a piece of paper that has uh, clearly been nearly burnt in several places, the ink on it faded and curled. With a scowl and a sigh, she glances down at it for a moment, then thrusts it toward Kiva. Here, read it then, so that everyone can hear it. Uh, uh okay. And I am adding in now to your inventory, uh, if you look under the inventory tab, uh, Van Richten's journal, if you'll give me one moment. Also, I'm not saying it's a sign that she gave it to keep it a read, but it's a sign. <laughs> and she was standing next to you. Anyways. Whatever. <laughs> uh, are you able to open that up? It's under yes. handouts. All right. So Kiva will take the journal page and uh, sort of look around, making sure that Ez wants her to read this out loud. And then uh, if she doesn't get any sort of uh, feeling otherwise, she'll start. For more than three decades now, I have undertaken to investigate and expose creatures of darkness to the purifying light and truth of knowledge. Kiro, I am called in some circles. Sage and Master Hunter, I am called in others. That I have survived countless supernatural assaults is seen as a marvel among my peers. My name is spoken with fear and loathing among my foes. She looks up and just sort of like makes a face like this is kind of cheesy. In truth, this virtuous calling began as an obsessive effort to destroy a vampire that murdered my child. And it has become for me a tedious and bleak career. Even as my life of hunting monsters began, I felt the weight of time on my weary shoulders. Today I am a man who has simply lived too long. Like a regretful lich, I find myself inexorably bound to an existence I sought out of madness, and seemingly must now endure for all eternity. Of course I shall die, but whether I shall ever rest in my grave haunts my idle thoughts and torments me in my dreams. 
I expect that those who think me a hero will change their minds when they know the whole truth about my life as a hunter of the unnatural. Nevertheless, I must reveal here and now that I have been the indirect yet certain cause of many deaths and the loss of many good friends. Mistake me not, I do not feel, I do not merely feel sorry for myself. Rather, I come to grips with the devastating realization. I now see that I am the object of a baleful Vistani curse. More tragically, the nature of this hex is such that I have not borne the brunt of it. Instead, far worse, those who surround me have fallen victim to it. I have related the tragic story of how my only child, Erasmus, was taken by a Vistani and sold to a vampire. I explained how Erasmus was made minion of the Night Stalker and how it was my miserable part to free him from that fate at the point of a stake. What I have neglected to illuminate before is how I tracked Erasmus' kidnappers across the land, or how I extracted Erasmus' whereabouts from them. In fact, the Vistani took Erasmus with my own unwitting permission. They had brought an extremely ill member of their tribe to be one evening and insisted that I treat him, but I was unable to save the young man's life. In fear of their retribution, I begged the Vistani to take anything of mine if only they would withhold their terrifying powers of which I knew nothing. To my lasting astonishment, they chose to surreptitiously take my son in exchange for their loss. By the time I had realized what had occurred, they were already an hour gone. Incensed beyond reason, I strapped the body of the dead young man to my horse and doggedly followed the Vistani caravan through the woods, naively allowing the sun to set before me without seeking shelter from the night. Shortly after darkness fell, I was beset by undead that would have slain me, had not their master, a lich, intervened and spared my life for reasons I do not completely understand. He somehow detected me and, with his powerful magic, took control of a pack of zombies that wandered in the forest. He spoke to me through the mouths of the dead things and placed a magic ward against undead on me, then animated the dead Vistana and bade me tell it where I could find its people. Unfortunately, I say in hindsight, the plan worked. I found the child stealers, and my unwelcome entourage included a growling horde of voracious undead that could not touch me, thanks to the Lich's ward. When I found the caravan, I threatened to set the zombies on the Vistani unless they returned my dear boy. They replied that he had been sold to the vampire Baron Metas. Something inside me snapped, I released the zombies, and the entire tribe was eaten alive. Yet the story has not ended. Before she died, the leader cursed me, saying, Live you always among monsters, and see everyone you love die beneath their claws. Even now, so many years later, I can hear her words with a painful clarity. A short time later, I found my dear Erasmus made into a vampire. He begged me to end his curse, which I did with a heavy heart. The darkness had torn him from my loving arms forever, and I foolishly believed that the curse had exacted its deadly toll. I wept an insatiate desire for vengeance, until an insatiate desire for vengeance filled the bottomless rift in my heart. When she's done, she'll just um, fold up the paper and give a look of just utter disgust to Van Richten. You note that Van Richten is just staring ahead, stony gaze, not meeting anyone's eyes, but just like a statue. And as you fold the paper, as Merelda grits her teeth, um, putting a hand up to her face. I know that you did not harm my family. I know that you did not harm my people. It, it, it was... Your mercy. It, it was your decision to deliver them to justice when I saw you that inspired me to find you all those years later. I want to know, to know what kind of man would do such a thing to spare the lives of those who had done so much to hurt him. 
But this says you took vengeance. I know that not to be true. Why did you write this? What does it mean? Van Richten takes a long, slow breath. His shoulders slumping. Very well. I suppose you have come this far. If the truth is what you ask, then the truth is what I shall give you. I wrote that entry. Well, it is not quite soon after my son's death, but it was before you found me. At that point, I had wandered for quite a time hunting those that preyed upon others from the darkness, trying to make right in some places what had gone wrong, finding places where those that should have gone beyond the grave still lingered to harm the living. And I, my thoughts were tangled. They were in many pieces, as I was at that point. You must understand, at that point when I penned this, I had recently experienced the trauma of a spiritual possession. My memories were sent swirling out of order. I feel that were I not to inscribe what I knew, this knowledge might be lost. Now, I, I tell you now that these words were accurate when I, to me, I thought when I wrote them, but it was not until later when I realized that I had mixed up the details. In fact, it was the sight of you, those years later, that prepared the holes that I had left in my memory, so I never returned to fix the pages. For you see, when I found your family, after I had learned that Erasmus had been taken from me and to whom he had been delivered, I held in my heart some hope that perhaps this creature might be reasoned with, that well, perhaps there might be some ways of getting to him before Baron might have done the worst. I thought, and his shoulders stiffen, and he coughs very briefly, just kind of harshly into his fist. I thought that something might still be done. And of course, well, and his face is just absolutely wooden. I found the Baron. I entered his castle. I found my boy. And I used the stake. He's quiet for a moment, a shadow across his face, and then he closes his eyes and says, For you see, there is some parts of that page that are quite true. For it was after Erasmus, my son, died that vengeance truly did fill my heart, and I am not proud of the man that I became in the years after my son's death. For you see, I did seek to hunt down those that had taken him. It was... Well, it is said that vengeance blinds us, and I was blinded in more ways than fun. Blood stained my hands, yes, of monsters, of demons, of dark things that sought to harm the innocent, but innocent blood as well, I fear. In this occasion, at least, I allowed myself to become as those that I had sought to hunt. For you see, I cared not who or what met the end at my hands. It fell. After my son's death, the events with the lich and the caravan that I encountered, encountered well, they took place largely as described in the page. For you see, I saw only when I saw the covered wagons, the caravan, the singing of the troop, I thought, well, I thought I recognized them. I thought that I had found the ones who had murdered my son, and, well, in that moment, and so I would never have done this before I came upon this encounter, and so I never would have sought to done it again. It's this one time, in this one moment, the hands that had spilled, the blood of monsters sought to, well, they saw monsters' blood to be spilled. And so I unleashed the undead that stalked me. It was not until I heard the seers 
prophesied curse that I realized that I have never encountered them before. That they were just in the caravan on the roads through the mists that fell. You see, the first part is I realized that I did not care in that moment. It was only later, after days had passed in the darkness, that I cursed myself in fear and rage and shame. I am not proud of what I did. The curse that lingers upon me, I have brought it upon myself, and I accept that it is one that I must bear. I do what I must to prevent it from falling upon others now. And I am sorry, truly sorry, for the lies I have told you. There's another pause as the room stands stock still for a moment. And then you hear Esmeralda, her face downcast, her hair falling entirely over her eyes, just black curls obscuring her face. <laughs> Tell me, I'm curious, who, who was the lich that you met? Ben Richter just sucks in a deep breath. My dear, I fear I am unable to tell you quite. Political reasons, I am afraid. It is for your own safety should you ever stray into his territory. But that is the only point upon which I cannot expound more. Please, believe me, I do not wish to bring pain to you, though I know that that is clearly what I have done. I do not well, ask forgiveness. I know that I abandoned and lost that opportunity long ago. He looks toward Kiva. That's the sound so, of her voice. So that maybe you can explain um, why, even if you were right and they were the people that took your son, why all of them deserved to die? Because, as you said, the vampire was the one who killed your son. So why kill an entire group of people? I mean, we've seen those caravans. More often than not, there are women and children among them. So entire lineages deserve to be wiped out because a vampire took your son from you. Venrichton sighs. I have told you, I am not proud of what I have done. I do not seek to justify it. It was abominable, and this I accept. And what exactly have you done to amend this other than lie to someone you supposedly care about? He looks up at you, and in that moment he looks very much a tired, exhausted old man. It was perhaps hypocritical of me, and well, when you came to me, and you looked at, you looked at Esmeralda. It was selfish, I know. It was, and I soon disabused myself of the notion. But for a brief moment, I wondered if, well, I had an opportunity for penance to help someone who sought a better path. Help others in a way that I had failed. And at this, Esmeralda's face just flushes and she snaps up toward him, her eyes flaring. So what, I was a pity project of sorts? I was, she says, no, no, not, it was not, I assure you, I, I sought only to give you the tools that you sought. I wanted you to be better. And Esmeralda just shakes her head, her long hair just kind of flailing. And at this point, you see uh, tears beating at the corner of her eyes. All of the times that I have known you, I wondered why you were, your damnable refusal to ever say what you were thinking. I wondered if it was my fault why you didn't trust me. I wondered, I knew there were some things you were keeping back, and I just, I wanted to know. But I thought that 
I had done something wrong. Is that because of my parents, you didn't think that I could... And she chose it for a moment. I... She closes her eyes and whispers more to those around her than anyone else. I'm sorry, I, I can't. And she turns and stumbles out of the room. Kiva just looks at Van Richten and goes, you're a fucking piece of shit, old man. And she'll follow Esmeralda um, out of the room. Esmeralda, by this point you see, is now picking up uh, speed, moving quickly. She slams the door behind her uh, to the uh, den that you had found, in which you can count the dragon. You hear her footsteps echoing away through the dusty foyer. Oh, in the fuck, distance, you hear a, a, a great door it. echoing as it grinds open and then slams shut. Yeah, Kiva will, like, go almost to follow and then remember the spider room and, like, do a, a real hesitation. Um, and she'll just still stand outside the door and just, like, listen to, see, to hear if Ez gets any trouble, but she's not going to follow until that because of spiders. Uh, I'd say given your passive perception, uh, you don't hear any sound of spiders. You just hear the sound of dusty, echoing footsteps and then the slam of a heavy door. All right. Um, yeah, she'll, then I guess she'll sort of follow in that direction slowly, not taking any particular time. She just wants to make sure she's okay. While Kiva's doing that, what's everyone else doing? Lillison glances over you, Davian, to see how he's reacting. Davian is looking somewhat horrified. Uh, he's got a very good poker face on, but there is a slip for a moment, and you can see his eyes are just wide. Um, he just He's just kind of shaking his head, muttering to himself quietly, but you can't quite make out the words. Beside you, you see Irina and Ismark just staring. Um, Irina, Van Richten, Ismark at the tiger behind him. Both of them look somewhat stunned. But you see Irina's eyes flicker toward the door, as you see as uh, Kiva and Esmeralda make their exit. Van Richten's just standing there like a statue. He's not moving or betraying any facial expression. I I'll hate to cut the tension. Uh, with possibly more tension uh, and I'm sure whatever this is and he very flimsily gestures towards Van Richten and his giant tiger this you uh, listen we, we got and Metran turns to the others we came here for a job right we've, we're we looking for something and we gotta keep looking uh, this is them and you know maybe we could deal with it uh, they can deal with it after this but the the longer we stay here, the, the more chances, you know, things like, and uh, he makes like a finger gesture with his uh, fig fingers, like a fanging gesture. The longer he gets here, or has a chance to get here, or sends somewhere here, like we just leave this here, and he points back over to Van Richten, and just go about our business. Arthur Deer, who's just been kind of off in the distance for a while, kind of jerks back to reality. Yeah. No, I... I agree. This is... not ours. It's hers. And we can do what we can to... He just kind of jerks his head over at Van Richten, and then at the direction of Esmeralda's retreating footsteps. Do whatever we can for her, I suppose, but we got a job to do. He turns to VR. Goodbye, Doctor. And... Vampire-free travels, I suppose. He swallows, looking a bit pale. And then closes his eyes and says very softly, And farewell to you. All of you. He opens his mouth as if to say something more. His fingers twitching, and then his hand curls, and his she just falls silent. 
All of you, go on ahead a moment. Yeah, no. Aerith is halfway out the door. He doesn't seem like he wants to look at him. As Amity leaves, she says, I, you, you made mistakes, but you're a vampire hunter, and I'm, I'm not going to give up on you. And Richton just shakes his head. And he kind of chuckles quietly under his breath. I appreciate the thought. Anyone, it's... But believe me, when you get to a certain age, you realize that... Well, there are things that one must give up on. There are beginnings and there are ends. And eventually... Well, one can reach an end sooner than they might wish, if by the tracks they choose, he sighs. You and your friends have better chances than I did. You will make better choices, I am sure of it. Go well. Do not trouble yourself with an old fool. Well, listen, old fool, if you've got things that you can do, use, or have anything that can help us you know uh the first way to make amends is reparation so maybe you know send somebody that good fortune our way if you have it he sighs well there's not over much that i can offer i fear I Nothing? am grateful, I, I must confess, for what you do now. But, well, if it may be some repentance for what I have done in the past. You seem to be, have gone to be trusted companions of her, have you not? I hope so. He nods. In that case, I am grateful for what you do to keep her safe. She deserves better companions than she once had, and I am grateful for your company to her. Please, then, if there is one thing that I can do, take this. And he reaches into his uh, long leather jacket, his leather coat, not leather jacket, and produces a furled scroll written on black parchment and tied with a small white ribbon. He holds it out toward you. Uh, I do yeah. not know if you can make use of this, but there's a chance that you may. Perhaps it may be of some help in keeping her and her companions hale and hearty in the face of the dangers they face. I fear it as alone as I am in my current endeavor. It is of little use to me. Does Metreon, it detect as magic? Metreon holds um, the scroll. Oh. It does not. It is not intrinsic. It is not a magic item. Um, but if you'd like, you can take a closer look at it. Oh, sure. Metreon can. Uh, well, yeah. No, Metreon is holding the scroll in his hand, uh, looking at Van Richten in the eyes, and says, "Right. Well, I'll." Uh, I don't know much about this, but I'll, I'll see if they do. Just in the meantime, remember what your fight is. It isn't with living, breathing people. It's with the dead. So keep that in mind when you when you stay here. Keep your focus, all right? You know, it's indeed I shall. May you go well and keep her safe. Yeah, cheers. Thanks a lot. And uh, Metreon puts the scroll into his bag and, and heads out. Okay, uh, what is Kiva doing? Yeah, so eventually, um, I'm hoping Kiva will catch up with Esmeralda eventually. Um, sort of trying to, you know, listen. I just didn't know where on the map to go, and I didn't want to necessarily yes. go so anywhere. So <laughs> I would say that you, like, as you emerge from the den, you immediately see one of the large doors slamming shut, as that echoes through the, the large entry door slamming shut. Got it. Um, and, you know, making your way quietly through the dusty hall, peering through the door as you make your way out into the 
uh, exit way where you see the large stone stairs leading down and the draconic statue, once proud, now tarnished and aged. You see Esmeralda sitting on the top step, her knees curled up to her chest and just staring out into the foggy woods. Yeah, she'll, uh, she'll go over and just sit right next to her. Um, and, you know, um, sort of do that thing when, when you're in someone's space that's just, like, letting you know that, you know, we don't have to talk, but I'm, I'm here next to you and, and, and uh, that sort of thing. And then, um, eventually she says, uh, you know, if it wasn't a waste of a spell, I would say you could, like, shoot this piece of paper with one of those crazy black lightning bolts that you have. It might make you feel better. She marks a soft, quiet bit of laughter, humorless. <laughs> I, well, I don't think so. It's, uh, I guess burning the paper won't make anything different, right? No, but I could, like, punch him in the face for you if you wanted. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I, I really do. But, you know, I, I think... She sighs, and you see, you know, kind of blotchy sp uh, spots on her cheeks uh, where, you know, she's clearly wiped away some tears. It, it's kind of funny, really. I guess all I wanted for so long was answers. When I found the that little page, I thought that, well, I, I was just so confused. It seems that what I wanted only brought more questions. And, well, I guess we can see how that turned out. If there's one thing I've learned in my time in Barovia, it's that this place unearths a bunch of shit that I wish I never knew about myself, or other people, or just the world. <laughs> kind of people in it. Mm. But what what he did to those people, and and what he did to you by lying about it, doesn't have to be forgiven, or or even you're so much bigger than this place bigger than him and and whatever he was using you for whether it was his own redemption or an actual way to try to make amends for what he did it worked because look at you you are brilliant and strong and incredibly powerful and I can say this with some certainty. Um, I'm sure your family would be very proud of you. Because I can't imagine a single person who wouldn't be, be proud of you when they met you. So I just think, feel what you are going to feel because of this and acknowledge it. But remember that this place is small compared to the life that you are going to live and the change that you are going to make for other people. If that helps at all. She sighs and looks up at you, meeting your eyes for a moment. Well, I appreciate all of the kind of words. Truly, I do. But I fear there was one thing you got wrong. I don't think my family would be proud of me. If they saw what I am now. So I'm sure they might say, I told you so. Well? They aren't as innocent as you might think. They, they did what he said they did. I ran away from home for a reason, Kiva. I haven't seen my parents in many years. She sniffs for, for a second, just kind of steadying herself and... Look, I... I came here because... 
I had a job to do, or I thought I had a job to do, and, and I still, well, want to do that job. I still want to see that the bastard in this castle taken down. But uh, I'm not sure what I want to do beyond that, but whatever it is, I. I don't want it to be about me, because if he was looking for, I don't know, any kind of repentance or redemption or whatever it might have been, I mean, I don't, looking in myself, just, there's a part of me that really just wants to hate him for what he did, but I can't. I've known him for too long. I've he, he taught me so much, and I just—it's it, not me that deserves an apology. It's them. She sighs and turns back toward the old dragon statue. Now, with moisture dripping down it from the continued rainfall as thunder rumbles in the distance from the retreating storm front. I guess there's just one thing I want to do after this. It's, uh, I want to find... the caravans that he killed. I, I know that with undead in the pictures, there might not be much left, but... If anyone hasn't already, someone's got to put some to rest. Proper rest. Well, I know a thing or two about burying people that didn't deserve to die. So, if you'll have me, I think that might be a fine adventure. And then after that, we'll see. She stifles a chuckle and it turns into a hiccup. She looks slightly offended at herself and then offers you a very thin smile and holds out a hand. Well, Kiva, you've been quite an enchanting traveling companion thus far. I don't see how I could turn down such an offer. But <laughs> in the meantime, gods, I must look a fool lecturing you about you all about weakness and then this. <laughs> this isn't weakness. This isn't weakness at all. Look, if it was weakness. And this is rain on my be... face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's all it is. It's just rain. It goes away and it dries. And you're still the strong woman that I know you are. So come on, let's go inside. Get what we came here for, if it's here. And uh, stop giving me hope for these future dates because, you know, we have a thing to do and you're being very unprofessional, you know, <laughs> like, all this flirt, it's ridiculous. So, um, you know, eyes on the prize, as it were. Yes, of course. Uh, very professional of you. And she uh, takes her hand and grins a little bit wider this time and putting a hand on her knee slowly stands up again. All right. Yeah. Oh, my heart. Okay. He was going back and Side, trying to like vomit and that was the coolest she's ever had to pretend to be um, for a while all right so as Kiva and Esmeralda make their way back into the dark foyer uh, is there anything anyone else is doing I believe you were all making your way out of uh, the parlor. I believe Lillison had to do something uh, yes anything from Lillison as Lillison watches everybody else walk out she waits for the space of five heartbeats and then she glances over at van richten and lets her gaze drop down to where the paws of the great saber-toothed tiger rest on the ground and she says how are you supposed to ever do penance after killing somebody who did not deserve it 
He shrugs and sighs. It was a foolish thought to have. I have done what I can in the years since, but I know that it is not a debt that I can ever repay. Someday, perhaps soon, I will pass some from the earth, and then we shall see how I shall be judged. Whatever it is, it is my fate. And I shall not run from it. Is that the only possible ending? Is it truly a burden that cannot ever, ever approach the light of redemption? He meets your gaze, his eyes dark and heavy. My dear, the seers were the quiet words for quite precise and accurate. May you live among monsters. May you see those who you love suffer and pass. Paraphrasing, I am sure, but... There is a reason why I did not allow Miss Stephanie to remain in my tutelage for long. And so I'm sure that's, that she now understands why we had to part ways. This is, well, not penance, but the seer spoke true, and I will accept it. The curse of a Vistana seer is not one that a man can undo lightly. And even if I had the means, I do not know that it is certain things that I would wish. I will meet my judgment. It is earned. I do not speak of a curse, unless the curse is what has brought this great heavy remorse upon your soul. But I think that that was there to begin with. I think that that is there whenever one realizes what one has done. He looks at you for a moment, and then his face broadens into a very tight, sad smile. Well, my dear, if the both of us survive the coming days in these mists, perhaps we shall have to discuss further. I enjoy conversations of philosophy, but I fear your companions might be missing you soon. I'm sure they do. I will ask once again, although I believe I know the answer already, if we do survive the coming days, how are we to find you again? He shrugs. Well, I do not expect to Path Belovia immediately should my target meet its end. Perhaps you shall find me somewhere amidst its settlements, its lands. You and your friends are resourceful. And besides, I am sure that, well, there are those in Velaki with many eyes and wings. Perhaps I shall help you find me. And he gives you a nod. Good day. Good day, Doctor. She nods briefly and turns and heads towards the door. He watches you go and the door closes behind you. And in that moment, as the group of you pause for a moment in the den, you hear the front doors closing and the footsteps of Kiva and Esmeralda 
emerging once more, more into the large foyer. Well, I, I think I got maybe some good news. That would be very welcome after the last five minutes. Uh, and Metreon rifles through his bag and uh, presents the black parchment uh, scroll. Uh, I assume this is something magical. Uh, maybe one of you who's uh, a bit more keen on this sort of stuff, maybe you can figure it out. Earth will gently snag the parchment kind of disinterestedly, like, uh, sure, another spell scroll. And then he starts reading it, and his eyebrows just go up and up but up until he has just got it laid out on the floor, at which point he just carefully slams it shut and puts it back. Ah. Oh. I'm realizing here that theoretically I shouldn't know what that is. Dragno, what's on the no. scroll? <laughs> As you read it, you quickly decipher the runes, which to your trained bardic eye are certainly uh, legible. This is a spell scroll of Ray's Dead, a fifth level necromancy spell to resurrect a fallen creature that has died within the past 10 days. He hastily <laughs> slams it shut and then gives it back to Matreon. Keep this safe with your life. Alright, yeah. Well, then what's it do? He kind of gathers the others around. Can he check for spies outside? Make a perception check. I yeah, can, when, I he, when he says that, I'm going to look around to see if I get a sense of any like scrying going on or anything like that. 17. 17. Looking outside, you do notice a flicker of movement, what looks like gray fur, perhaps, just as the very tree line in the distance where the road meets the path that leads to the mansion, perhaps, you no, know, I don't know, a few hundred feet away. But well out of any reasonable creatures yes, in range. Certainly. Okay. Well, wolf in the woods, but y'all, this Shall is... Shall I pop up my ears or something? No. This... Or actually... Yeah, my, do you think not, it might was... be a bad idea. Yeah, it's up to you. But is Lawson actually going to do that? Lawson strolls over towards uh, the barrel room. Okay. Y'all, this is a spell of raised dead. Why would we want to raise dead? I, no, no, not that one. That's animate dead. There's a distinction. Like, it brings per a person back to life. Oh. 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 So, like, if one of us, in, you know, if we can't get to the Abbey. Then we can use this. Now, there are some restrictions. They can have been undead. So, I'm... Um, Sorry, Matreon. And they can't have been dead more than a ten day. Metreon looks at Earth and Deer and then reaches into his bag and pulls out the jar of Lucian. You hear that, Lucian? No go on that. And he puts it back in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Earth and Deer looks just mortified. Uh oh, uh oh. But yeah, um if any of us or if we meet someone that's just died recently we can use this. This is incredibly valuable. Well, let's hope we don't need to use it to die. I mean, I don't yeah. know what the, hell is, what the hell else is waiting for us in this place, except for, you know, giant spiders. I don't know either, but just keep it safe, all right? I got it with my life. Well, <laughs> Not so much your life that we immediately have to use. No, it no, no. Me. I mean, it's, uh, I'm going to guard it with my life. And if I die, you have to use it to bring me back. So. Fine. If you insist. Let's go meet the others. Uh, Lil Lillison, you can come out now. Lillison comes out and uh, just takes a look at everybody's expressions. Earth for Deer is just smiling a little wider than he should be. Damn it, he's a little giddy. Metron shrugs. It's, it's, it's nerd shit. Let's, let's get out of here. Uh, put your faces under control. 
I can guess too much already. <laughs> Never. You hear that, people? She knows we found the spell of Kona Cold. Hope Straw doesn't like freezing wind. Metron rolls his eyes. Come on, then. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Hey. Kiva, Ez. He kind of, his gettiness falls when he sees the tear tracks on Ez's face. I, are y'all, I mean, I, of course you're not okay, but. I'll, I'll be fine. Please, don't worry about me. We've got, uh, we've got, uh, is this sort of place to check out, yes? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's get on that. Uh, the doctor said something about there being undead wandering around. Maybe we should get a view of what those actually are. And we should probably stick together then to do that. Wandering off or splitting up into smaller groups just feels like a bad idea. Wait, Agreed. Kiva. Kiva. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I, I might have been drunk, but did you say when, when you was around, like, undead things that, like, you smelled things differently? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it smells like, like, rotting flesh and, like, disease, I guess. Do it smell like that now? Let's find out. Ping. All right, what are you looking for? I think she's triggering divine sense. Ah, yes. I am uh, you, tr you trigger one of your uses of divine sense, uh, and you detect no undead celestials or fey uh, within the immediate vicinity. Right. Well. Uh, no, it just smells like dust in here, and uh, like um, you know, it hasn't been cleaned. But no, no undead thing. All right. In that case, I think we're safe to leave the entrance hall and either y'all want to go deeper in or head upstairs. I mean, you know, let's go deeper in. So. I mean, yeah. So you've shown us on many an occasion. He's shown you that. Metaphorically. Mm, okay. If there are giant spiders elsewhere on the first floor, I would like to know. Yeah, yeah, better not to get penned in. Let's check out the rest. Yeah, I'd really not like to see any more spiders if it's so possible. Ever again. Sin walks towards the uh, southeast doors, and uh, 30 feet ish away, she's going to cast Mage Hand to open one of them. All right, go ahead. You see, ah. in the distance, large spider-like limbs ah. slowly crawling over a massive <laughs> net of webbing. Oh, oh, just you realize spiders. it's a fairly large room. It seems to proceed uh, further on the east and west sides. Same giant spiders. Let's leave that door alone. Please. And it again. Okay. Earth points to the door to the top right maybe that one next or wait is that that one's already cracked is it not I believe it is and I don't like what that might mean Aerith is going to quietly step forward and peek through okay you step forward peering through into the next chamber you see a 20-foot-long table with sculpted dragons for legs standing in the center of this hall. The chairs that surround the table have backs carved to resemble folded dragon wings, and several of the chairs have been overturned or smashed to pieces. Suspended above the table is a crystal chandelier that glows with a soft white light, and standing in windowed alcoves are two life-sized statues depicting knights with dragon-winged helms and shields. Rainwater trickles through cracks in the ceiling, flowing down the west wall and adding to a large puddle on the floor. Glancing inside, you see five sets of wooden doors leading to this hall. The doors in the northeast corner, through which you now peek, hang open. A pair of leaded glass doors, their panes cracked and broken, stand open between panels of stained glass set into the east wall. These panels depict silver dragons in flight. And beyond the glass doors lies a dark, misty room that on first glance appears to be a chapel. Uh, Mitrion looks over at the other room. Oi, is Rena. 
Dev, let's go. And uh, as we're getting close to that chamber, uh, is there any way to tell what the crystals of the chandelier are made of? Looking at the chandelier, they appear to be just... Um, not... Actually, you know, looking over them, if you want to approach the chandelier and the center yeah. of the table, you may do so. Excuse me, pardon me. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at him. Okay. Uh, make an... I'd say history check for me. Oh, great. Fifteen. Fifteen. Um, looking over them, they don't appear to be diamond. You're not sure of the exact make. Uh, they don't seem especially valuable. But they certainly illuminate with an unearthly radiant glow. There seems to be perhaps some kind of magic that ex that's extruding this light. You're not sure. But each one of the little dangling uh, shards of crystal that hang from the chandelier has its own illumination that lights up the room around it. Randy, this looks like anything to you. I mean, I don't think it's diamonds, but there's, uh, these things is lighting up on their own. Hearth takes a step inside, just goggling at everything. It's gotta be some sort of magic. And a long-lived one at that, that spells don't normally last that long. It's... <laughs> uh, Amity, as you step inside, uh, with your detect magic still active, you see, uh, a small aura of evocation magic glimmering from the chandelier. <laughs> it's it's mad so much stuff is magic. Okay, um this one's evocation. So like it might explode. Oh. Nah, not all Evo does. It it's also, you know, the business of light and energy. I doubt this is going- this is a trap. It would be a really expensive trap. Well, if it's not a trap and it's not valuable, then I uh, don't really care about it. Oh, it's plenty valuable. Oh, Earth well, is, shit. But I'm not sure if it'd survive being taken down. You might just have a old crystal chandelier. Uh, also, we're not looting this place. Why not? This when is... was that decided? Whoa. This is someone's home. This they... is no one's home. Really? I mean, not for what? Not for hundreds of years, at least. I mean, maybe yeah. It's a it's a home for a bunch of giant spiders. Look, maybe they'll be angry. If you find like somebody left a open safe full of jewels, I'm not gonna stop you. But like the chandelier, the silverware, there's a monument. Need to be careful with this place. Fine, fine. I'll leave the chandelier, but if there's silverware, I'm taking it. Amity, as you step forward, you see in front of the doors leading to the chapel, dark reddish stains upon the flagstone floor. You're right there, Amity. Uh, just it, it. It looks like there's a little bit of. Maybe blood over there. Emily points through the door. How old? Uh, Dragon, presumably, I can't tell, but pretty old? Uh, you can get closer if you'd like to take a look. Amity's gonna gingerly, uh, get closer. It's gonna be like a All ghost right. of a dragon. Make a medicine check for me. Okay, cool. Um, one. While well, she's doing that, what's everyone else doing? As just... well as she's doing that, you see Davian just kind of glowering at the doors. Don't like leaving in my back turns. Hope there's nothing in there. Well, and drag we'll and uh, start cautiously opening the other doors. You get dragnet. Is this water just a puddle, or it's just a puddle, as far okay. as you can tell? Yeah, he'll follow uh, Lillison in, at a distance uh, for fear of spiders. 13, oh. but it, I mean, he doesn't want to like get down and lick it or anything. <laughs> Very fair. That's a shame. With your 13, the blood seems to be relatively not recent. It's not like wet or anything, but it's not old enough that it's desiccated and faded entirely away. Perhaps 
a few months, years, you're not sure of the exact timing. But as you look up from the blood, you see another stain on the floor to the east. Then another. And another, a trail of blood stains leading further in until you see just leaning off to the side of a pillar what seems to be a metal gauntlet with its rusted fingers still curled around the rusted hilt of a half-shattered short sword. And as you peer further into the space within, you see several cracked wooden pillars supporting a wooden U-shaped balcony that overhangs this stone-walled chapel. You see narrow archways leading to spiral staircases that curl up to the balcony and a door set into the north wall with a wooden beam barring it. At the end of the east, at the east end of the chapel, you see resting a stone altar flanked by iron candelabras. The altar is carved with a rising sun-bossed relief and tall arching windows set with panels of stained glass decorate the walls behind the altar. One of the windows has been shattered, covering the chapel floor with shards of colored glass and allowing thick fog to enter and fill the room. And through the fog, you see three armored figures kneeling before the altar. There is a faint stench of death on the air. Dragna, unrelated question. The door yes. to the south that I just opened, does that door open in or out? Uh, that door opens, I would say, in. Uh, and you can see on the other side... Uh, just a heavy shroud of webs, just a little bit above, and a massive spider-like limb pressing down into the gossamer uh, net there. Yeah, just wanted Seems to make to sure spiders. I, had, um, I had opened the door right into the spider, so... No, uh, the spider appears to be just barely above the door, but yeah, very I'm gonna, close. I'm going to close that door again. Entirely reasonable. What'd you hey. say, Lil? More spider. Oh, God. How many, Emily, what, what you got are you down doing? There? Um, there's some knights. It's it's like in my dream they're, they're kneeling on the altar. Um, she's gonna call into the room. Uh, you you're you're fighting some kind of fight that won't end. Do, do you want help? Uh, can, can I free you? Your voice echoes through the misty chapel. Uh. As you do, and as your companion's words echo behind you, you hear the grinding and clinking of metal against metal as one of the kneeling figures slowly turns its head to face the doors. You sure that was a dare good idea. return. It slowly begins to, to ascend to its full height, tattered chainmail clinking in the muffled air. Uh, and sorry, what did it say again? It asked, you dare return. Um, so it's rasping as though it hasn't been used in decades. Amity is now backing up slightly. I I, 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 I haven't been here before. You're thinking of someone else, in, unless you mean in the dream. It takes a step forward. It's eyes locked upon you. Tell the devil that sent you that the order of the silver dragon will not abide his servants. You watch as its hand moves to its side. A hand, you realize, that is half-rotted, a pallid, sickly gray with flayed muscle and bone exposed to the air, its skeletal fingers curling around a rusted steel hilt, which it draws, revealing the dulled blade of a longsword. Hey, no devil sent me... Oh. <laughs> go, go ahead. No, no devil sent me except extremely indirectly. I don't think it's going to help. You feel a burning gaze fall upon you, Amity. So, you confess then. Watch as its two compatriots arise beside it, the three stepping forward, drawing their swords together, three pairs of red irises glowering from the fog, their eyes sunk deep into wrinkled, ancient flesh. The first undead warrior bears yellowed, cracked teeth and howls, Be gone! And whirls toward you. I will need everyone to roll initiative, please. Oh, great. Wonderful. 
what we like to do around here. Can I bring my mortician knowledge in and say that this encounter actually couldn't happen if they've been here that long, so we don't actually mm -hmm. have to fight it? Sure. Also, has everyone already rolled? Uh, uh, I no, think, I we're think in the initiative from the last war. Gotcha. Let's clear that initiative, and let me add everyone back to the tracker. Yeah, this couldn't exist, Dragon. I don't like this. Isn't this isn't realistic? And also, right, like, yeah, dead sorry. people don't walk around. This. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, that's, that's a ass. seven. I rolled a five more this time than last time. I'm. That's a nine for me. At least Davian is in this. Yeah, Davian <laughs> needs a twenty-four. Done. Good for him. All right. So, Davian is up first. He immediately spits. What in the bloody blazes have you done? He will take a step forward, look down the hall at the warriors approaching. Oh, fucking hell. And he will draw uh, from his side a crossbow, uh, taking aim and firing. Uh, that will be a 14 to hit, which does hit, dealing seven points of piercing damage. Uh, with that, you watch as the crossbow streaks through the air and at that moment slices across the exterior knuckles of the figure there tearing more of the flesh free from the desiccated bone but the soldier seems almost entirely unperturbed by this stepping marching forward its eyes glowering in the darkness Davian curses and uh, begins loading a new bolt uh, Amity you're up alright um, Amity uh, protests. Uh, no, it's, it's not what you think. As she backs up um, onto the big table, uh, you're confused. Like you're you're lost in the woods, and she's gonna cast a little bit of a spell. The spell confusion. Oh ho oh, 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 boy! Oh, a little bit of um, sort of. Uh, Trees, sort of mist like woods imagery briefly surrounds these revenants. You're gonna need to make a, a little bit of a wisdom save. Okay. You watch as this sphere of illusory matter and light flashing and blurring with strange patterns emerges around these creatures that immediately begin looking around with some minor skepticism. Two of them continue their march forward unabated, but one of them falters for a moment as the illusions and patterns take hold. Uh, it fails its wisdom saving throw. The one in the middle. Hmm. Okay, well, one is good enough. And uh, Amity will enter turn sort of crouched behind the table, sort of looking under it at these beings. All right. With that, Irina is up. Uh, she will muffle her own curse. And she will uh, step back here... Uh, behind Erythrondir, and she will uh, pull out the hand crossbow that Metron gave her, load it, and point it right toward the door, preparing to shoot if something, anything comes through. With a growl, uh, you hear the three warriors begin to step forward now, their chainmail clanking in the misty air as the one that was wounded flexes its hands as you watch Amity. Even through the mist, you can see the flesh knitting together, beginning to heal until there's almost no sign that any wound was there at all. The Devil's Knights fight even weaker than last they came. You shall be easily dispatched from these sanctified halls. And with a roar, they rush together into battle, holding their longswords up high. Uh, sadly for them... Uh, they must dash to get toward you. But one slams forward directly into the table, almost knocking it aside. Sorry, and the confused one, one it did in fact ah, yes. move forward? It needs to. Uh, yes, I have to make a D10. Oh, alrighty. Thank you for the reminder. No problem. 
I have the table up. If you that know. is a nine. What happens on a nine? Oh, oh well, uh, fortunately, it can, in fact, act normally on a nine. So, yeah, it can come up against that table. All right, it comes up against the table and slams it uh, into it with its side, causing the whole thing to splinter and crack and shake. Um, the other one will make its way forward, uh, bearing its long sword, and uh, kick the table aside, causing it to like skid and slam into your gut, Amity, uh, as it begins making its way around the side. Um, but that is the end of their turns. A wisdom save Willison. for the confused one to see ah, the effect yes, ends. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Lovely. That is a 14, so another yes. failure. Yeah, still confused. All right, Lillison, you're up. Lillison looks over her shoulder at Metreon and says, Do you think they'll calm down if we just go around the corner? I don't think so, not now. Fair enough. And she is going to stretch out her hand and aim. Um... Ah, they have to be within five feet of each other for Acid Splash. Uh, she'll aim a Poison Spray at the bottom one. Okay. Um, there is a splash uh, of greenish, noxious gas that extrudes through the air toward it. It steps forward, and you realize at once that it's not inhaling it at all. And as the gas brushes across its eye eyelids and the other parts of its body where you would expect a sickness to carry across it, there is no impact whatsoever. It seems utterly immune to your poison. Lillison's eyebrows go up and she pales for a moment. Um, and for one instant, she looks torn between looking helpless and looking absolutely gleeful. Uh, then she draws her dagger and that's the end of her turn. All right, and as I neglected, Irina's crossbow does go off. She's going to fire at the one on Erthrandir's other side, taking a minus two penalty because he's in the way. Uh, unfortunately, missing uh, the bolt flying through the air and glinting off the side of the uh, undead's tattered chainmail. Uh, with that, Elicent's turn is up. Erthrandir, you are up. Okay, what are these things? That is make, what he wants to know. Make your choice of an arcana or religion check. Arcana, please. That is a 25. Okay. Um, looking over them, you can uh, see just a little bit as one of them runs forward. The f you catch a glimpse of the flesh knitting together on the central one's hand as it slams toward Amity. You see the a fiery intelligence burning in their eyes and a glint of human uh, sapience and sentience. These are not mere undead, but you see in their teeth they're not vampires, they're not ghouls. And then it comes to you. You've seen these things once before. And the tattered remains of a dead soldier, tortured and torn to pieces in an atrocity and abomination in the war-torn remains of your home. These are revenants. Cursed spirits brought back to inhabit the bodies of the dead to seek eternal revenge upon those that dispatched or harmed them in life. Gray, necrosed bodies ever regenerating and seeking only with a blind hatred against the ones that wronged them in life. Oh, no, 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 no. Does he know anything about their capabilities? Yes, they are exceptionally strong. Uh, they are exceptionally resistant to any sort of uh, mind alteration. Uh, due to their natural fury and devotion to their vengeance. Um, you would know that as members of the dead, uh, those efforts to cause necrosis are less optimal as they could be, and given Lillison's experience, poison certainly seems to do no good on the flesh of the dead. Um, you do know that they're, they do regenerate quickly the overwhelming will and uh defiance of their spirit actually patching over the weaknesses of the flesh they inhabit with one exception if their flesh has been damaged by radiant energy or by the heat of fire the regeneration halts for but a few moments enough to take one down 
at least until its spirit flees to a new corpse within the next several miles. Erthrandir looks like he's getting ready to turn to run. His eye, his pupils just blown out in terror, and then he barely manages to compose himself. The revenants, they don't, not gonna die easy, undead, no poison, fire and light. We need fire and light, or they're gonna regenerate like the vampires do. Then I, but I can't do fire in here. I can't. And he reaches a decision. Oh, fuck it. And he looks this revenant in the eyes and draws his sword and then holds it in front of his body and begins to hum. And as he does, he's going to tap into the magic of the blade song. What? As he does this, you watch as shimmering fey energy uh, begins to trace up and down the lines of his blade. You watch as Erthrandir's form begins to blur almost around the edges, growing indistinct, ethereal in a way, as you hear this keening hum that grows to a cry of ferocity, defiance, and the thrill of battle. And as he moves, his form is almost fluid like a dance as he looks forward with a deadly gaze in his eye. Get away from my friends. And then he lashes out the green flame blade. That is a 23 to hit. That will certainly hit. For 14 fire damage. Jeez, oh, sorry, all four, right. Okay, sorry, for 10, for an uncertain amount of, for a mix of fire and slashing damage. Gotcha. Uh, let's take a look at how this is distributed. How, uh, which die is the fire die? Uh, fire die is the d8, slashing is the d6, gotcha. but I don't think the resistant die either. And is this magical damage? Uh, no. Gotcha. Um, looking over this... Sorry, just checking one thing very quickly. I don't believe the resistant to non-mad- to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, slashing. This is true. All right. Uh, in that case, yes, you slice forward with the blade as this green fire bursts around it and moving with the elegance of a dancer, you pirouette and slash it across its side. The rest of you watching as there's almost this singeing as the rotted flesh and tattered cloak there burns and singes away, crackling with smoke. Uh, it takes 14 points of damage. And okay. you watch as its flesh immediately moves to knit together for a second and then halts sputtering with ember and charred sparks. And then, like a kind of bravado you've seldom seen from him, he leaps onto the table, like laughing at the two of them. Come on, then. If you want to hit anybody, then I'm right goddamn here. And that is his turn. Alrighty. Uh, that is the end of Erthrinder's turn. Esmeralda is up. Uh, she will draw her rapier and her uh, hand axe. And she will lash forward whirling uh, toward them. I think I have a pretty good guess by the words of what these guys, of who these guys don't like. Well, she's going to make uh, two attacks with her rapier and uh, one attack with her short, with her hand axe. All of which hit, carving across the uh, revenant that Erthendir hit for a total of 29 points of damage. Grunts falling back, pairing for a moment with his longsword as their weapons lock and she pushes them back and then she slices across the wrist and it snarls for a moment, the flesh failing utterly to continue healing as the fire spreads across it. Uh, that is the end of Esmeralda's turn. Kiva, you're up. Woo! So I'm going to like dance this crowd of people. All right. And end up over there, because I have enough movement to do that now. And, um, hmm. Let's see here. I, w I could hit both of those guys, but this one is just out of my range, right? The one to the north? Correct. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to, uh, she's going to bonus action, turn on the sun sword, and, uh, make two attacks at the guy in front of her. All right, go for it. Uh, 
Uh, so the first one is a 27. I'm recklessing this, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Second one is an 18. Okay, let me just make a quick mark of recklessness on you. Hopefully I remember that. Please remind me if I don't. Um, okay, so the first one was 27, second one was 18? Yes. All right, both will hit. How much damage? Uh, fuck, math. Uh, six and eight is 14, and six and five is 11, so 25 point damage. Beautiful. And that, then... You, mm -hmm. Oh, um, I'm also oh, you going adding to... Hell yeah, I'm going to use one, one of my spell slots and add a uh, smite. All right, roll that smite damage. Uh, that'll it's be measly. 3d8. 3d8. Oh, it's 3d8. Oh, it's against an undead, yeah. baby. This is what you're good at. Uh, 15 additional. So what is that? 40? 40 points of damage? Yeah, that's 40 damage. Fucking hell. With that, you Fuck slice her. forward. You watch as there's a shower of white sparks as your sword slices across the Revenant's longsword, the blade humming with hunger and rage. You stab forward as you watch as the impact site is just scorched with a bla blasted blazing white, the wound flaring with radiance as the Revenant stumbles back, and there's a blaze, a burst, a nova of white from inside of it as the entire area is just scorched with the blinding radiance of the burning sun sword. Uh, it is... Took a lot of damage from that. Yeah, that's that's my turn for right now, I think. Okay. Let me just mark down that I took radiant damage. And very good. Uh, Ismark is up. Uh, he will hap... Oh, sorry, Metreon is up. My mistake. Yes, I am. Uh, so backed uh, against the wall, uh, looking at these horrible... Uh, undead creatures, he starts to feel his body start to warm up uh, and uh, there's this energy that gathers around him and he look just looking at the uh, the revenant that is down between Erethrandir and Ismark uh, his eyes go wide and he is going to cast Sacred Flame Okay, Ooh. this is the one between Erethrandir and Ismark you said? Yes Alrighty Put that up in chat so I can have it roll a dexterity save. That is unfortunately a 17. Bah. There is a uh, blistering white uh, crown of flames that appears for a moment and the revenant twists violently out of the way. There's a flare of light, uh, but unfortunately the target is a good foot away from the site of the attack. Yeah, that's it. All right, Ismark will take his turn, uh, drawing his long sword and silver short sword and slashing away uh, at the Revenant cornered by him, Esmeralda, and Erythrindir. Uh And hitting with all of them, uh, first with long sword carving across the side, stabbing across the shoulder, and then thrusting the short sword uh, directly across part of the chest uh, for a total of 19 points of damage. The Northern Revenant is looking pretty roughed up by this point. All right, uh, Davian instantly curses, fucking hell, I'm not fucking dying in this mess. Uh, and he will jump up, uh, surprisingly nimbly for a man his age, ducking behind uh, these open doors, pulling his crossbow and firing a shot uh, directly toward the most wounded Revenant uh, in, the, in the course of the melee. And he will... Uh, with a 20 to hit, that'll hit, dealing 7 points of piercing damage. And then he will take cover uh, in the corridor over here. Alright, uh, that is the end of his turn. Amity, as your turn begins, you watch, as all around you, there's this uh, caustic melee, the table jerking and splintering places as bodies slam and impact against it. Um, you can see uh, one Revenant whirling, parrying, uh, dodging, and doing its best to block but utterly failing as it's caught on three sides by different opponents as Erethrindir's movements across yours blur with the whining hum of the blade song and as Kiva is locked in a radiant duel with the Revenant to your south. What are you doing? There is a confused looking Revenant that has its longsword raised up with two hands right over your head across the table from you. What are you doing? Okay. Um, Amity is going to back away from this guy and- He is going to, can he, does he have a reaction? Uh, uh, he doesn't. 
Really? Confusion takes away your yeah. reaction? An affected target can't take reactions, Dragna. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Be spicy. Just a little fact. Um, <laughs> and backing up over to here. Two, three, four. Um, Amity is just going to uh, Vicious Mockery, the one that's utterly surrounded, um, saying, You've never even seen a devil. Uh, and is there any wisdom saving throw, please? Okay. That is a fat eight. Roll another <laughs> d4, Linus. Oh, 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 right. I need. I do need to roll another d4. Uh, so it takes five damage and has a little uh, effect on it. Um, and finally, MD will give Bardic Inspiration to Kiva. Um, it, you, you think you've got the one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, that's her. <laughs> she's like screaming. I think she's got it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Love it. Um, uh, Amity, as you cast your vicious mockery toward it, um, the words of your insults flying from your lips, you watch as the uh, undead's face twitches for a moment, a small uh, bit of blood trickling from one of its nostrils, but it instantly steals itself. Uh, it does not seem to be. Uh, exceptionally vulnerable to psychic damage. It takes uh, half damage. Okay, interesting. Mm. Alright, is that your turn? Uh, yeah, that was my turn. It's Irina now. Okay. Uh, Irina will load her crossbow again, taking a step back beside Davian. Uh, and she will fire a shot at the Surrounded Revenant as well. Uh, that'll be a 22 for four points of piercing damage. Nice. Right on target. Uh, and Amity, you were uh, Vicious mockery the Surrounded one, right? Uh, yeah, the one surrounded by Erisindir, Esmeralda, and Ismark. Gotcha, just checking. Okay, great. Uh, that is the end of Irina's turn. It is the Revenant's turns. Uh, with that, you watch as... Their flesh kind of sizzles and twists, warping a bit as it struggles to heal, but you watch as the radiance uh, glowing from the sights of the wounds and the embers still dancing across them seem to form an impenetrable bulwark against the regenerative efforts. They do not regain their hit points this turn. Uh, the two that are not confused will make their attacks. Uh, first off, the one that was wounded uh, between the three sword holders is going to go after Erythrindir. So, it's going to make two attacks slicing across you uh, with its longsword. Alrighty. Uh, the first one is a crit. Great. That'll deal uh, 15 points of slashing damage. Ow. Okay. You hear as it's this terrible ringing noise as its blade grates against you as you're parrying and ducking back, but uh, slicing barely across you as you feel your exhaustion begin to take hold in your limbs, your movement's growing more sluggish. Um, and the second attack is a 21 to hit. Okay, so as the as he takes the first strike and then the second, he raises a hand in the same way he's seen Lillison do many a time, just palm facing out and cast shield. Okay, as he does so, uh, spitting out the words of the incantation, you watch as uh, unfurling from the palm of his hand um, a spiraling cloud of thick mist that swallows up the incoming blow. And then there's a ripple for a moment. And there's another wall of mist that emerges to Erythrindir's left. And the blow passes right through the first and exits through the second. The Revenant, uh, Paul, unbalancing Paul, for a second, looking utterly bewildered. I want to be clear mm -hmm. about the crit. Um, so the effect of Vicious Mockery was disadvantage on its first attack. Oh! Uh, yes. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So take away that 15 damage. Yep. What did it roll? Because only the twenty-one, because only the twenty-one would hit, and you didn't take damage. Phenomenal. So, thank you, Linus, and it'll attack a second time with disadvantage. Then. Yep. Uh, a thirteen. Does that hit? No. So do I All still right, need time, to make the shield, or? Uh, I would say you need to make the shield if you want to block the twenty-one to hit. Okay, then yeah, just checking. Yeah. All right, only the first attack had disadvantage. To be right. Gotcha. Yeah. So the shield shimmers in the air, uh, redirecting the attack. Uh, and this, and the second one coming toward you, Erythrindir's figure blurs with the form of the blade song and utterly evades the attack. Um, the second one by Kiva 
is going to make its own attack as well. Uh, Let's this time go. with a grunt of rage uh, spiraling toward you and slashing its longsword toward you twice, almost hacking away like a butcher. Uh, it will have advantage on its attacks because of the reckless. Hell yeah. Uh, that is a 22 and a 20 to hit. Both hit. Okay. Uh, the first time, as it hacks toward you, um, slashing across your chest, that'll be 12 points of slashing damage. The second time, shifting its weight to its left foot and thrusting forward, there's a... It almost starts to tear toward your heart as you parry it away with the blade of the sun sword, but it still scratches across your shoulder. Uh, you suffer another 12 points of slashing damage for a total of 24 this turn. Tch, nothing. Alright, because it's halved because of Barbarian. She's not raging. No, it's not. Oh, she's not. Raging. Boosh, boosh. <laughs> Love it. All right. With that, uh, it, our confused Revenant has a chance to go. Uh, he has to make a d10, right? Uh, yes. That is another nine. Come on! Uh, everything. You watch as he lifts a leg and kicks the table, sending it... Uh, Flooding to the ground, its uh, legs facing upward uh, toward the chapel with this free environmental interaction. And then with a rotting hand, he crunches through the splintered side of it, vaulting over to the other end toward Lillison, lifting his longsword, fire burning in his gaunt, withered eyes, and will bring it slamming down toward her twice. That is a 12 to hit and a 13 to hit. Neither of those hit. All right, you watch as uh, Lillison Blur is quickly moving with a nimbleness, uh, nimbleness, the first blow smashing into the top of the decayed wooden chair there. The Revenant struggling to break it free for a second. Lillison uh, pivoting away and forcing the Revenant to waste its second slash as well as it passes not even anywhere close to her chest. That is the end of the Revenant's turns. This guy will make another wisdom saving throw. That is a 13. He is still confused. <laughs> Not that it'll do anything, but that's good. Hey, no reactions, right? All right, Lillison, yeah, you are up. Not. You are adjacent to a very angry-looking Revenant. Uh, behind you hear, like, the dribbling and the rippling of the water as your foot steps back into the cold pool. Um, and it is absolute mayhem all around you. What are you doing? All right, Lillison is going to glance over to Erythrindir and give him a little nod. Uh, out of character question, it, what direction is Erythrindir facing? Uh, probably towards, probably towards the Revenant that is and is marker fighting, so she can, he can see her. Okay, uh, in character question, are you going for the one in front of you or the one behind you? I, the one in front, we gotta hit these things with fire, light, if they go, if they're gonna stay dead. There is a gap in his armor to the left his left ribs right there and he is going to get the help action on his next attack against it he nods a battle a smile a sort of vicious smile on his face damn right thank you and then Willison is going to do her new thing uh, Dragna, Ooh. do you have a uh, do you have a description prepped for it? Always. With that, you watch as Lillison raises her hands, uh, working a familiar kind of magic to you. Uh, let me just check the components of this. Uh, you hear her murmur a word, her fingers curling in strange shapes, and then you watch as her body dissolves into green mist, sickly and acrid, and then vanishes. The mist dissipating from the air. Let's what? see if I actually what? Quit? Yep, I totally vanish. Bye, guys. Oh, oh my god. What? You legend. You legend. All right, Erthrandir, you're up. Lillison is MIA. All right, is there anything Lillison would like to do on her turn? Uh, no. You can also uh, send me anything through a message if you would like to be cagey about it, which sure. I fully respect. All right, Erythrindir, you're up. Lillison right. just vanished in a puff of logic. What are you doing? 
have time to worry about that later. For now, she's told me about a very delicate place in between his ribs, which Erthrandir is going to try and insert his short sword. Go for it. Green flame blade. Uh, and I needed it. That's a 23 for <laughs> 18 total damage. That certainly hits. You slice the blade forward, the green flames burning and licking eagerly up the sides of the sword and slamming it to the side. You see the skin reddening and charring as the undead flesh actually burns away uh, from the point of impact. Uh, it suffers the full 18 points of damage. Not right. looking great. And then he's going to look back to Kiva, say, All right, you got this. Heal! And she is going to heal for an indeterminate amount once the macro finishes. You know, just numbers. Nine. Heal for nine. Awesome. Thank you. All right. There is a sharp jolt of pain as you he, as you feel one of your bones kind of crunching and your muscles burning for a second. And then you watch this part of the wound on your left shoulder knits together, uh, healing with unbroken skin. All right. Woof. That's his... That's his turn. All right, Esmeralda is up. Uh, she is going to continue going ham on this puppy over here. That is several hits uh, for a total of 23 points of damage. By this point, the Revenant watches the flesh is struggling to regenerate, but utterly failing to do so. Wounds appearing from all edges as the three of you toss it back and forth like a ping pong ball almost, slamming from one side as it struggles to deflect the blows from its three opponents all around it, but utterly failing as each uh, gap it closes its defense opens up two fresh ones. You can watch a sweat beating on Esmeralda's forehead, uh, a grin opening uh, on her mouth. Uh, that is the end of her turn. Kiva, you're up. All right. Um... Let's see here. Uh, Kiva's going to bonus action rage and then uh, recklessly attack twice again with the sun sword, this guy in front of her. Okay, go for it. Uh, 21 and a 19. 21 and a 19. Uh, those will certainly hit. How much damage are we looking at? 14 and 13, so 27. Okay. White sparks fly again as the rays of the sun sword slashes against this creature's flesh, actually searing the chainmail white in places as small bits of white smoke curl up from the point of impact. The undead gray flesh actually a brilliant uh, pale white from the point of impact. Uh, this revenant is not looking good. I believe Amazing. she's also got I the I magic table. Oh, she raged. Oh, yeah, she... got it. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. Okay, we got a rager over here. I think this is the one that I always get. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> is this the pixie again? No, it's when... You... It, it's the retribution. Yeah, it's the retribution, so it's okay. When she gets hit, she'll do some stuff. All right, very good. Uh, that is the end of your turn. That is my uh, turn. Metreon, uh, you see Lilith and Vanish from sight. Uh, one of the Revenants getting absolutely wrecked and Kiva locked in mano a mano combat. What are you doing? Uh, Next well, to Amity. As as, uh, well, as soon as Lilith disappears in that puff of green smoke, uh, Metreon's eyes turn towards the Revenant that's on the table and uh, he turns his uh, golden flame focus towards him and he's going to cast Sacred Flame at him. All right, that'll be another dexterity saving throw. That is a natural one. This is the one in the middle of the sword fighters, right? Uh, this is the one on the on the table. Oh, the one on the table. Uh, the one who who just was going after Lillison, right? Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Uh, that is a failure. Uh, how much so damage? It's gonna be. It's gonna be uh, twelve plus three, so fifteen points of radiant damage. Nice. All right. You watch as there's this halo of blazing white light that descends and wreaths it in flames for a second. You watch as its clothing actually seems to alight with tiny uh, tongues of, fo of white fire that curl down the sides, burning and incinerating away at it. The Revenant snarls for a second as you watch its flesh sear bright with, with the impact again. Uh, All right. I'm going to use my bonus action to disengage. All right, very good. Where are you headed? 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead Although, and... Are, are you sure you want to disengage? You're not next to anything. Yeah, but this thing could just come and attack me, which I don't want to happen. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to go over here. And, yeah, that'll be my turn. Okay. With that, Ismark is up. He will take his attacks um, as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Could I change out the dodge action? That's what I meant. Yes, that, that's what I assumed you meant. Rogues, yeah. sorry. Dodge oh, wait, the rogues? Ah, they don't get that. It's just dash or disengage, right? Or hide. Mm, yeah, unfortunately, you cannot dash with your right. bonus action. No, that's fine. I'll just disengage. That's fine. Just a flex. That's fair. Yeah. All right. Uh, we watch as the Revenant turns northward toward Ismark, and Perry's blocking two of the blows with the long sword and the short sword, but then Ismark whirls, pulling his blade across the side and just slashing right across the Revenant's uh, stomach. You see this kind of pale, sludge-like blood begin uh, pouring forth onto the ground. You see actually in a place where it's carved aside part of the uh, internal organs, what seems like bones from the back poking through. It is a grisly sight uh, as it suffers nine points of slashing damage. Uh, and with that... We are at the top of the round again. Uh, Davian will pop out of his hidey hole and take another shot. That is a 13, which barely hits, dealing 7 points of piercing damage. You watch as the crossbow bolt slams right near the eye, a thick cloud of reddish blood falling across the sclera and obscuring the revenant's vision in its left eye. Davian gives himself a cough and a self-satisfied nod and steps back behind the door, reloading again. Did you say cough or caw? Uh, it is a cough. Are we sure? Yes. Amity, you're up. Oh, uh, cool, cool, cool. Um, Amity's going to run over here. Uh, trying to squeeze into the wall sort of as far as you can get from this thing while still being uh, over here. And... Uh, she is going to say, oh, you, 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 help, get him away, and she's going to shove her hands out. Um, uh, he, he needs to make a strength saving throw. He's going to be shoved away. Ooh. Okay, you're taking the shove action? No. Ah. <laughs> you watch for a moment as small spirals of mist swirl around her arms. Her eyes blaze with a silvery light for a moment and then go dark black. You hear her last syllables echoing with a strange, harsh uh, after sound. And for a moment, Erthrindu, you're reminded of the voice that seemed to speak through her at the seance at the old tower. And at that moment, you watch as apparating in the space just before you a stony-eyed silvery ethereal spirit of what seems like um a knight in similar armor to this one, bearing a cracked, shattered helm and a dented, bludgeoned chest plate, looks grandly forward and then slams forward against the revenant before it. Uh, now this is... Is this shatter? Uh, sorry. He needs to make yes. a strength saving throw or he gets pushed five feet away from enemy. Gotcha, so this is what I thought. Okay, great. I am oh, I see what you're doing. so confused. Okay, so you watch as the spirit appears and slams toward it. Uh, strength saving throw, let's see how he does. Pretty strong. Mm, that is a 21. Is, I'm oh, sorry, saving throw or a check? Saving throw. Oh, um, yeah, it's okay. Um, you watch as the spirit uh, grimly thrusts forward with a nimbus of force and the revenant grunts with its last leg struggling to resist it and slams back with a reserve of unholy force. He watches the spirit Amity summon scowls and vanishes in a twist of spiraling mist. <sighs> oh, wait. thanks for trying. She claps and then uh, she's going to use her action to cast Shatter. Not quite as good as Shatter as if it had been shoved back, but still, Ooh, it hits nice. these two bottom revenants. Okay. Uh, they need to make some uh, con saves, please. All right. Uh, confused one uh, take has a 13, which is a failure. Uh, and the one by Kiva succeeds with a 20. Okay, failure takes 15, success is half that. All right, you watch as 
uh, shockwaves uh, filter through the air, slamming against both of them and causing the table to actually splinter and groan as it smashes to smithereens. Uh, the southern one not taking over much damage as its uh, chainmail uh, just uh, kind of slams against it, uh, clattering and oscillating from the weight of the blast. But the one beside the table just kind of its limb folding sickeningly off to the side. You hear a loud crunch and a crack as the wave of force slams into it. Um, and several shards of the splinter table embedding themselves deep into its flesh. Excellent. Um, and with that, Amity will end her turn, unfortunately uh, cowing a little away from the Revenant that she's directly next to, but beggars can't be choosers. Alrighty. Um, very good. And with that, uh, just a quick question. The one in the center by Aerithrin Deer's bottom left, the one that Amity just... Uh, the one that failed to save has not taken fire or radiant damage, right? Yes, he has. I I green flame. Oh yeah, him. the sacred flame. No, or the one the one to Aerithrendir's bottom left got hit by sacred flame. The one to yes. his north took a green flame blade. So Beautiful. both of them have taken. Yep. Let's keep in track. All right, Irina's turn. Uh, she will step over here and fire a shot at. Uh, let's say the one uh, between our three uh, compadres, right by Ismark. All right, that will be a 15 to hit, hitting, in fact. And you watch as the bolt slices through the air and slams right through the neck, impaling right through the esophagus and ripping out the other one with a wet spray of blood and gore. The Revenant's eyes widen, and then it slumps to the ground, unmoving. You watch as Irina gives a shaky, pale-faced nod and begins reloading. And in that moment, as you turn, begin to turn away from the corpse, you watch as its mouth opens, a faint spiral of cold mist escaping from its jaw and wisping away into the air as its eyes go dark. God okay. Damn, Our poor Revy boys do not get their regenerative heals. Um... The Confused Revenant will roll a d10. Let us see how this lab does. That is an eight. What happens? Um, oh, unfortunately, um, the creature uses his action to make a melee attack against Erthrendir. I don't know whether it gets a multi-attack. Um, it just says, uses its action to make a melee attack. The wording's... Uh, multi-attacks are a special action, so it's a melee attack. So just one hit. Okay. Nice. Unfortunately, that is a 21 to hit. Do you still have the shield up? Uh, it's passed since last turn. He's gonna let that hit mm -hmm. him. All right, that will be uh, seven points of Wait, splashing damage. Doing? No, no, cutting words. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. no, I don't think so, darling. <laughs> that is no a 13. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, that that's not gonna hit. It All right, blurs aside for a moment, and the attack utterly misses. Uh, the one by Kiva will continue wailing on her. Just tacking and slashing. Here we go. With uh, advantage. With advantage, yes, thank you. That is an 18 and a 20. 18 and the 20 hit, yeah, because 18 is my AC. All right. It slashes across you. You parry, you thrust back, and it slices across uh, your side. Another cut right across your knuckles. Uh, you suffer a total of 16 points of slashing damage. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, that is the end of the Revenant's and it turn. Takes 2d6 force damage. Ah. Oh, hell yeah. Because I can do it last time. Yeah. All right, roll them. Well, 1d6. No, two. Uh, two no, attacks. Each time it hits, it's not a reaction. I love you for knowing me better than I know myself. Uh, seven <laughs> force damage. Eat shit. Beautiful. You watch as uh, every time it hits, there's a thunderous clang through the air, like a bell ringing, uh, and a thunderous wave of force pounds outward from the force of the blow. You watch as the Revenant's body actually ripples from the attack uh, as the air pulses around it, the chainmail uh, clattering and contorting in strange ways as the blast slams and actually embeds the chain in places across its flesh. Uh, it will take the seven force damage. You're welcome. Beautiful. All right. Uh, that is the end of the Revenant's turns. Uh, Lucas, you're up. Lilison will reappear directly to the south of Erthrendir. Jesus! Er, I'm sorry. Krillian! 
you watch as Lillison immediately appears. You watch as her fingers actually move as though she's drawing a veil from over herself, apparating as the green acrid mist uh, uh, apparates in the space and is pulled away, revealing Lillison just beside you. Lillison, what are you doing? Lillison glances around, uh, looks at the slumped form of the one that just fell, and says, Nice work. Uh, then she's gonna take a stab at this guy. All right, stab away. Ha <laughs> ha yeah, no. That's oh, an 11 uh, yes, unfortunately, you stabbed it to the side. The Revenant, still confused, kind of stumbles for a moment, and it's just bad luck. You're, it actually thrusts your bow a little to the air as you uh, try to adjust, and instead your dagger just kind of glances off the side of the overturned table. Uh, then she's going to glance over to Aerith Rindir and uh, say, he's going to be overbalanced for about three seconds. Good I luck. I sweep the leg. All right. End of uh, end of turn. Uh, she disappears again. <laughs> Love it. Love All right, this. that is gonna be Lillis' turn. Turn, Erethrin, dear, you are up. You have a very off balance, still confused, undead friend to your bottom left. What are you doing? Indeed. And what kind of man would he be if he didn't take advantage of that? As he's going to worm his way between these two, and then slap, bring out a green flame blade. Uh. That's a 20 to hit for 10 total damage. All right. You bring it flaring through the air forward. You watch as it catches across the side of the undead, the clothes uh, catching flame with the green uh, viridian light that quickly spreads to a familiar crimson. It beats it out swiftly, but you watch as there are uh, these deep scorched burn marks across the side where the uh, flames had stretched across its flesh. And then he's going to move next to Kiva, giving her a quiet little smile. You're doing pretty well for yourself, it seems. I know, she's too busy rage raging. But... <laughs> she just, like, smiles and her teeth are bloody in. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Turn. Uh, that's his turn. Alrighty. Uh, with that, Esmeralda will take a step forward, uh, vaulting over the table and joining Erythrondir in his dance of death. Uh, that is three hits. That'll be a total of 18, 27 points of damage. Cool thing. Nice work. Keep it up. As they're almost on their last legs. Kiva, your go. Oh, God. I love it. All right. Uh, same thing we do every day, Pinky. And uh, I'm going to recklessly sun sword. Love it. 23, 17. Okay, 23 and 17. Uh, both will hit. Oh, wait, no. Sorry, oh, no, the ordering. sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, 23, 23 14. 14, damn. Gotcha. Both will still hit. Oh, quite cool. I was going to have to use my bardic inspiration. All right, Um. so 14 and 16 is 30. Points of damage. Uh, are we looking at the same... I, I, are you? I'm, I'm so at... dumb. I'm not. Yeah, you're right. No, you're it's good. twelve and eight. I'm like reading my things wrong. Twelve and eight, mm. and eleven and five. So twenty and six. Thirty. Thirty six. Thirty six points of radiant damage. <laughs> okay, good. All right. You watch as the sun sword blazes with light, and you slice it directly inside, embedding it in the flesh of the revenant. Before you watch as the flesh is seared white. You actually watch as the veins. Rotted in a crow's turn, blindingly white. Its eyes dazzled for a moment by the brilliance around it. Uh, that is, looks like it was fit and hit by a truck. Um, now, this is a question because I've never actually been a barbarian paladin. I can't cast spells, but can I still use a spell slot to smite? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, Whatever you hit, yeah, you, can, you can smite. All right, yeah, then she's going to use another one, 3d8, smite this guy. All right, roll it. 16! All right, as well, the blade remains lodged within the flesh, you see another nova, a burst of white flame, and you watch as the eyes shine outward like lighthouse beacons as this brilliance uh, burns away at its innards. 
All right. It's it is looking be very unhealthy. That's like oh, it, it's very close. Fifty points of damage. Let's go, y'all. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Kiva is a beast. Metreon, you are up. Uh, Metreon still scurrying back towards Davian and Irina, uh, clenches his hands together again, and he's going to try and engulf the uh, the revenant that's still on the table in more sacred flame. Alrighty, that's a dex save fourteen. Unfortunately, that is a 17. Feeling really useful, guys. Um, yeah, uh, that'll be my turn. All good. Unfortunately, these are nimble, dexterous revenants. Uh, there's this blinding flare of white light, and the revenant lifts the longsword to its head just for a moment to catch the brunt of the blow, the white sparks dancing up and down the length of the metal as it grits its teeth and kind of squints toward the white light there, backing up a little ways into the table to avoid the worst of the attack. You can tell they're on their last legs. They're being it's, It looks like it's being forced back and is a bit unsteady on its feet, especially with the lingering effects of the lights and Amity's confusion remaining. Uh, that is the end of Metron's turn. His mark is up. He's going to follow Esmeralda's lead and launch to position beside our confused-looking friend. Uh, unfortunately, missing twice as it stumbles for a moment, catching itself and then lifting the longsword to parry, block both blows with a solidity of strength that Ismark barely manages to match. But as soon as it does, Ismark pulls up the short from, from from beside and jabs it right under the breastplate. The Revenant's eyes flare, but you watch as this kind of sluggish, putrid blood begins to droop forth from the dead wound as it suffers eight points of piercing damage. All right, that is the end of our boy Ismark's turn. Davian is up. He will pop out, fire a shot, and then pop back in. Unfortunately, going wide as the crossbow thunks right into the overturned table. He curses and steps back, reloading again. He glances toward Irina and Metron. You hear him mumble, "Cause shooting girl, don't let it up." All right, uh, Amity, you are up. The 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 mayhem seems to have shifted toward the southern side of the room. You are standing there on the ground. You see the corpse below you, the mist curling forth from the chapel as the battle rages. What are you doing? Uh, Amity dances next to this downed, smashed table right up to the confused Revenant. And she's like, oh, you, you're going to hit me? She, she steps five feet away. No, you can't. Oh, you're going to hit me? No, you can't. Looks like oh my friends God. having a little bit of trouble. She's using vicious mockery on the bottom one. <laughs> oh my oh, God. I love that. <laughs> oh my God. You gonna try that on Strata? I might actually kill you. <laughs> All right, let's see how our boy does. <laughs> make a wisdom safe. Uh, that is a crit, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I'm very but sorry. Amity will end her turn here and she will uh, like push out her arms again, and the confused one just needs to make a little bit of a strength save or get pushed away from her towards its friend. Okay. Unfortunately, that's a 25. You watch as the wisps forearm up in the shape of the night again, which slams toward the revenant, looking confused, uh, wildly pushing against it again. It strains from when you see like veins popping at its undead neck, and then the Onslaught falters and the spirit scowling disappears. These right, seem well, to be very strong boys. What can you do? It's Irina's turn. Okay, Irina will take her turn. She will fire a shot. Unfortunately, missing. Uh, as caught between Ismark and Esmeralda, she struggles, paltering for a moment as she tries to avoid hitting either of them. And then her hand slips on the trigger and the bolt hits the overturned table. First thing, she steps back to the top corner and reloads. All right, our boys have uh, a fire radiant damage on them, so neither of our revenants will be healing at all this turn. Um, looking around wildly, um, the confused one will roll a d10. That is a three. What happens? Amity? It does nothing. Oh, sorry. A three. Um, yeah, three will not hit. Like no, it rolled a three on the confusion table. 
Oh, 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 sorry. Um, yeah, no, it does. It just sort of stands there, uh, spinning slowly. All right, you watch it just kind of just stands there, stunned for a moment, its eyes rolling, um, this kind of strange expression falling over its face as er as uh, Aerithner, you see this kind of glimmering light surrounding its face, and you're reminded of Amity's magic from before. Uh, the one that is next to Akiva will snarl, uh, pivoting to face Erythrindir as he seems to be fixated on another foe. Um, it's going to attack you, my long-haired elven friend. Indeed. Uh, that is a 17 and a 13. No. All right, both times, almost like backhanded, without even looking, you bring up the short sword behind you, deflecting it with a clinging hum of the song-like resonance of the blade song singing through your veins, each movement coming as easily as though you were a trained dancer in this moment. The revenant snarls with anger and frustration. You're going to have to try a little harder than that, darling. Mockery of the devil will not save you. We know what purpose his servants come to these halls to sully with their foul presence. You may strike us down, but we will ever more defend it. And I am done negotiating with people who are trying to kill me. All, All right, right. Lillison, you're up. All right, Lillison is going to reappear directly north of Erthrandir. Oof, hello again. Uh, was there a save against confusion made? It was. Uh, I need to... Oh, right. Uh, no, it did not. Not this turn. Let me see. Uh, 23. That is a success. It snapped out of its confusion and stopped hurting itself. I regret asking that before I took my turn. Um, never uh, I would say you could see that uh, before your turn began. Okay, yeah. No, I'm still gonna uh, pop out at the same place. Um, okay. And Lillison will go in with her dagger once again. That is a 24 to hit. That stab will stab. What's the damage? Right. Uh, that is four straight up damage. Um, it's been so long. Uh, how many die of sneak attack do I get? Uh, that depends on how many levels of rogue you have. Ah, but that would be telling. It would. Mm -hmm. but I, I mean, you can make this a blind GM telling. roll if you'd like. I mean, I literally don't know how many die. I think it's two. Okay. <laughs> Your rogue level divided by two rounded up. Ye. Thank you, Linus. All right, that is a total of um, nine stabby damage. Nice. All righty, stabby, stabby. Uh, then she looks over to Erythrindir and says, left or right? Left, or from her perspective, or right, sorry. Uh, the one key doesn't fight. The one key was not fighting? Left shin. Thank you. Unfortunately, this time Lillison stays here. All right. Is there anything you'd like to do with your bonus action? Uh, that was my bonus oh, action. Oh, that was your bonus yeah. action. Right. Yeah. I was confused. Okay, cool. All right, Erthrender, you are up. He's not one to let a good bit of tactical advice go to waste. Flame. Green. Blade. I love it. Classics. And I needed that. That's a 25 to hit. For twelve total damage. I really Alrighty, this is against the southern one. Uh, this is against the one to his north. Gotcha. All right, spiraling, you thrust the blade forward, sparks flying and setting more green flames running up and down the sides, stealing the twelve points of damage. So this one's starting to look hurt. Radical. Oh, it's only starting to look hurt. Go well, it, it was looking hurt before, but it's starting to look pretty bloodied. Alrighty, radical. That's my turn. Alrighty. Uh, as is up, she will take her hacking and slashing. Uh, hitting the first two times and missing on the last one, uh, dealing 14 points of damage. Such ends her turn. Kiva, you're up. You are facing off with this one in front of you. You've got Erythrindir to your right-hand side, dealing with another revenant that is in the middle of a four-character pileup. What are you doing? Oh, I love this. Well, I'm going to just, you know, finish this guy off, I hope. It's 
So looking at this properly, that's a 21 for 18 points of damage, and then a 26. Before you say that, I would let you know that the first attack is a 21, which hits, dealing 18 points of damage, <laughs> slams right through the chest, and burns it away, searing in a burst of white Nova-like light. You watch as white light shines from its eyes again as you watch as radiance blinding runs up and down its veins, burning it away, and then it slumps to the ground, unmoving. All right, well, can I use that second, second one? Yeah, can I can I jump up on the table and go to town on that second guy? Absolutely. All right, so that's a 26. <laughs> so it's 14 Very points good. of damage, and I'm going to spend my last spell slot to uh, Divine Smite it. All right, let it be smitten. Uh, oh, uh, 14 plus 19 <laughs> is what? 20-something? 20, 20, no, 30-something? 30 32? 33. 33. How do you want to do this? <laughs> um, <laughs> so she's going to, uh, you know, finish that one off, just sort of, like, sharply turn her head, jump up on the table, and with this sort of, like, feral scream, she's just going to slice through the neck of the Revenant, like, severing its head from its body. Almost like a baseball bat swinging, like, across the room. And as you do, you watch as the entire body, now uh, decapitated by the blazing slash of the sun sword, in the place where the blade made contact, you see a rolling wall of white flames moving across until the entire thing is engulfed, burning with a white fiery light being to smoke and ash. And at the last moment before the head burns away, leaving only the bone behind, the eyes roll back, the mouth gaping open, and a sliver of mist escaping into the air before it vanishes. And that is where we will take our break. Hey. That was a fun way to kick things off today. We've Party. gotten really powerful, y'all. Level 8, gang. Level oh, 8, gang. So good! <laughs> I feel like we all, have, uh, we all have like very powerful toolkits, but they, you know, we're still trying to figure out how they actually f like connect with each other. Yeah, that's what I'm running into. You'll figure it out probably, ish. You we'll you give there. us a lot of credit, Kragna. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how this turns out. You got 15 minutes to coordinate because we will pick this back up after, as always, our 15 minute break. We've got a few messages from our D and D community. Uh, this week's fireside chat is a conversation between myself and our producer Shiplukas about the role and process of espionage in your Curse of Strahd campaign. So please do enjoy, and we'll see you back here soon. Fireside Chat, a short interlude with weekly features, where I, Yehoz Lucas, will be showcasing and interviewing prominent D&D creators. This week, we are talking to Dragna Carta, the author of Crystal Reloader Guides, and the Dungeon Master of Twice Bitten, about using espionage in your Crystal games. What is espionage and why is it important? Espionage, put simply, is just the process of finding things out that you don't currently know, often through the use of spies or other intelligence gathering. Espionage in general, whenever you've got two sides in conflict, is absolutely critical, either in war, as I'm sure Strahd as a general would know, or elsewhere. You know, preparation is king in a lot of areas. And just in the context of a D&D campaign, and a villain especially, it's really critical for letting that person organize, plan what they're going to do. Strahd especially, you know, is a very strategic villain. He has goals, he has a logic to what he's doing, and he wants to have the best tools and resources available to achieve those goals. So in Curse of Strahd, Strahd is trying to spy on the PCs and learn more information about them. He wants to know who the PCs are, who they know, what the PCs are doing, 
what they want, what they're capable of. He's going to want to know when they're acting, where they are, and where they're going. He's going to want to know how they're doing what they're doing, what kind of tools and strategies they're employing. Uh, he wants to know how they plan, what their process is, and of course why they're doing what they're doing, their goals, their purposes, their reasoning. On top of that, espionage also helps you direct the flow of the campaign in general, because you're asking questions like, what does Strahd know, when does he know it, and to what depth does he know it? And this really helps build and drive roleplay, both when Strahd is on screen and when he's off screen, doing things in the background. Because whenever you're running a Curse of Strahd campaign, one of the first things you ask yourself when you're preparing a session is, what is Strahd doing now and what is he going to do next, right? You want to know what your next Strahd encounter is going to be. You want to know how his presence will shape the world and the adventure. Because really, that's what the campaign is all about. How the PCs interact and feel the effects of Strahd on their lives as they go throughout the campaign. But again, he is a very goal-driven person when it comes to the characters. He wants to find a successor or a consort. He wants to corrupt them and turn them to his side. Or he just wants to, you know, put them through torment and give them a really bad day. And overall, it's really important to understand what Strahd wants to know and how he goes about acquiring it and what he learns, because these concepts really help shape the overall campaign. What roles should espionage play in Curse of Strahd campaigns? First off, just atmospherically, there's this ever-present threat of spies and eyes and ears lurking in the shadows where you can't see, right? Going by the book, there are everything from bats to wandering Vistani, wolves, werewolves, the druids of Yester Hill, the berserkers of the Balanok Mountains, even charmed Barovians, or, you know, if you want to make it a little spicier, traitorous Barovians of Verlachians who are secretly loyal to Strahd. If you're on Verlachi, maybe you can even toss in the vampire spawn in the coffin maker's shop. You've got a lot of options here. And something that I think is important to keep in mind is that these are, as the book puts them, wandering groups, wandering bands. These are not spies that report to Ravenloft every day and Strahd tells them, okay, you're going to Berez today, right? That's not what's happening. These are wanderers. These are just servants of Strahd that happen to be in the right place at the right time. And if they see something interesting, they report back to the castle. Barovia is just carpeted with Strahd's spies. Every corner and every branch of every glade should feel like it is beneath Strahd's power and within his knowledge, and I think that's a really important concept to convey to your players to really feel this oppressive force of the vampire who's always watching them. Your players might and probably should feel very cagey about how and when they reveal information. If they use the Sun Sword against the vampires in Velaki, sure that might help win the battle, but if someone sees that and reports it back to Strahd, then you've just lost an ace in the hole. This is something that really helps make Strahd this very ever-present threat. There are ways to keep track of this as the book gives you options, you know. Strahd's spies are reporting to him morning and night, certainly. You want to choose one that fits the terrain. Maybe if they're in a town, that is a charmed Barovian. Maybe that's a bat at night. Maybe during the day, a disguised werewolf sneaks into town, posing as a human. Things like that. And then you just see if their stealth beats the PC's passive perception. Because you want to see if the spy is going to get away with the information that they glean from watching the players. And, you know, overall, the goal of these spies in these campaigns are to help Strahd by giving him the information he wants and also the tools he needs for scrying. And this information in turn, as I've said, really shapes how Strahd acts and reacts, especially when you're talking about things like Strahd encounters, especially as you ramp up his antagonism throughout the module, especially as you shape how he interacts with the PCs and, you know, chooses his targets, whether that's, you know, the next location he'll appear or which player character he's going to prioritize and exactly how he plans to do that. What kinds of information is Strahd interested in, and how does he acquire it? So, when it comes to what Strahd is looking for, there are a few different categories that I think you really want to pay attention to. The first one is, of course, combat, but also out-of-combat capabilities. Spells, of course, are huge. If your wizard knows Fireball, if your sorcerer knows Suggestion, if, you know, your bard knows Fly or Polymorph, Strahd wants to know that. That's really critical information for him. Not least because if he, you know, makes a strategy involving pushing people off of buildings and your wizard knows Featherfall, it's going to be really embarrassing for him. But on top of that, he wants to know about mobility. He wants to know if your monk can run up a wall, because suddenly three-dimensional combat becomes that much more of a concern. If the PCs have the sun sort of the holy symbol, holy cow, that is something he absolutely needs to know. Um, on top of that, he wants to know things like the PCs' personalities, whether they're defiant or coward-like their skills, whether they're, you know, comfortable with animals or particularly stealthy or very well-versed in history and political persuasion. You know, any proficiencies, tools that they can use, features that they have, 
any capabilities that they have in general. What you want to be doing, basically, is over the course of the entire campaign, from the first session, Strahd is trying to build in his head a mental model of your player's character sheets. And how well his spies do dictates how well he's able to form an accurate depiction. Other kinds of information he's looking for might be the PC's current location, their destination, so he can choose where to strike next. He might want to know their achievements, their struggles, any time they've been defeated so that he can better understand their psyches, get inside their heads and manipulate them further, especially if he's able to find out their attachments. That's leverage that he can use over them, maybe even up to the point of taking hostages in the late game. And their goals, right? Not only can he find, you know, weak points that he can abuse or corrupt, he can also find new ways to coax them over to his side, or tempt them in ways to really drive a wedge between members of the party. That might mean learning their histories, maybe they have a death of a loved one in their past, or, you know, maybe they're very ambitious, maybe they're very power hungry. Maybe they want to live forever, or they want all of the knowledge that they can get. If you want to take it to the next level, especially once Strahd is interested in taking consorts or searching for successors, he might even approach a character and offer vampirism itself in exchange for regular reports, which of course, you know, over time he might turn into, yeah, so you've already been helping me, now help me kill your friends, and I'll give you what you want. One thing that some DMs use is scrying, but I would caution against this largely because scrying has a lot of limitations. It takes a fifth level spell slot, it only lasts for 10 minutes, it has a very bounded radius. If there's a vampire hunter in Barovia right now, Strahd does not really want to waste his fifth level slots if we can help it. Especially if there's a chance of failure because he doesn't have additional material components, because his spies haven't given him hair, weapons, or clothing or such yet. So I personally tend to reserve scrying only when Strahd is preparing to attend an encounter with the PCs, and otherwise just entirely rely on his spies. How might you use spies and espionage in other campaigns? There are a bunch of different ways that you can use spies and espionage in other campaigns, other than just Curse of Strahd. Here they make a really oppressive, hostile environment, but you know, in another campaign, maybe a dark fantasy or a more traditional fantasy like the Forgotten Realm setting, espionage is huge in war-themed campaigns, intrigue-themed campaigns. If you want to go for something political or something like Game of Thrones, intrigue is huge. You know, you have generals, you have lords and ladies, you have kings, and everyone wants to know what everyone else is doing, especially if there's a big war going on in the continent that your player characters are involved in, right? Maybe your PCs are, you know, fighting for one side and the other side wants to know what they're doing and where they're going. Maybe even you can have the PCs acting as spies or committing some kind of counterintelligence, rooting out spies in their own ranks or in the area around them, so potential fun little plot hooks to keep in mind. And just generally, if you ever have a module with a notable villain or a recurring villain like Strahd, you can really use spies to really make that villain's presence always felt. Lord of the Rings does this to a certain extent where there's always servants of Sauron, of Mordor, scattered throughout the land. Sauron is always watching, there are the Nazgul hunting. So, you know, this is just another way of extending that villain's arm and reach into the PC's lives and reminding them who exactly they're dealing with. I, Count Strad von Zarovich, and I bid thee listen. The Guild of the Black Crow have produced over five hours of ambient sound design for my most beautiful and ancient land. As used by Twice Bitten, these ambient backgrounds include my most private and intimate of letters, as well as bonus tracks not found in the Dungeon Master's hand. So, hear me now. I guarantee you safe passage to their camp. Support them, and perhaps we shall meet sooner than you think. <laughs> if you think
think your hometown has problems? You haven't spent nearly enough time in the village of Barovia. Over the years, their taste for human flesh had only grown. The vampire spawn, the undead cult, the werewolf den. I just think we can do a little better here. Grab our shovels and we're gonna add some depth to help you run your best curse of straw. Strawn. 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 Possible. You're welcome. He flies into a fit of rage that is unparalleled. There's child abuse galore through this thing. He's been nailed to the wall with very long iron spikes, and I imagine it's been a very uncomfortable time for him. You see, in tracking a monster, one always needs proper bait. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, before we get started, a few quick announcements. As always, thank you to our virtual tabletop sponsor for this campaign, Foundry VTT. Uh, secondly, uh, we do still have, for at least this week, our Twice Bitten audience survey, Mark II. We would love to hear your thoughts on how you enjoy the campaign, how you consume the campaign, and uh, whether you might be interested in potential things in the future. So. You can find that at tinyurl.com slash tbpoll2. That's tinyurl.com slash tbpoll2. Uh, one quick note, uh, the stream will be away uh, next Saturday, June 12th. Uh, so there will be no episode next week, but we will be returning on Saturday, June 19th. So after today, we will see you all in two weeks time. Uh, Twy, what do you got for me? Hey, y'all. Y'all know what month it is. And in honor of that, and our very, our very, very gay little stream, Happy Pride Month. Subscribe if you wanna. Not saying you gotta, but I am saying that, I mean, you might. You could. It'd be cool. You'd be rad if you did. You get such great things, like emotes, and the spot in all of our gay little hearts. And, for, and really, isn't that worth everything? Serena? Oh, you know, every week, I think, 
I'll be able to follow this one, and I'm wrong. Um, if you like what you are watching, you can join the discussion on our very own subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash twicefit and D&D, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash c slash r curse of strahd for all of our past sessions, fireside chats, video essays, and highlights from the stream. As always, you can submit any art or questions you might have for future after darks to twicebittencos at gmail.com. Thank y'all. All right. Thank you, Twy. Thank you, Serena. Thank you to everyone else for sticking around. Uh, and I think we're good for now on announcements. So let's dive right back in. So, as the last revenant falls, the decapitated head rolling across the ground, its eyes rolling back, and the faint sliver of mist escaping its cracked, desiccated lips before its flesh is consumed by white, sacred fly fire. Each of you were left alone, panting, sweating, and a bit more tired than you were 60 seconds ago. As you look around at the shattered, splintered remains of the table and the blood now staining the ground, you're left in the quiet silence of the manor around you. Dragna, are there any doing? like physical remains beyond just like ashes and skeletons? Uh, and skeletons? I believe there would be. Let me double check. Because if so... I'm going to look around. All right. I believe that there would still be remains left. Yes. Okay. It is just yeah. those three revenants, though. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'm going to rifle through their their corpses, muttering to myself about yeah. how much of an asshole they were. Uh, so each one of the revenants has a rusty longsword, which seems reasonably uh, usable. Um, as well as tattered chain mail that has holes in several places. It does not look fully protective. It's probably no better than leather armor at best. The rest of them, they just have, you know, tattered, burnt, torn clothing that looks like it's been worn for the past several decades. There's not a lot on them in great shape. Uh, useless. Anyone want any of this? He holds up the long swords. Erythrindir doesn't answer, kind of staring down with an uncharacteristic intensity. He raises his short sword, and over one of the bodies, he cuts off its head. It rolls across the ground. Just moving systematically, he does the same to the other two. There. There. Now they don't have anything to come back to, the bastards. Because they would, otherwise. You can't keep these things down. We'll keep that other one if you want to crush that steps skull up. there. Esmeralda steps up beside you, shaking her head. Well, I think it's quite likely that they wouldn't come back to these particular manifestations, but, well, if there are any places for them to be, well, any of their corpses in the land around us, she looks a bit hesitantly around the old manor. We had best be on that guard. Yeah. Yeah. God damn it. And help. Finally, she that is everybody okay? Yeah, I, I could go a few more rounds. I think she's yeah. like cracking her bones and like <laughs> wiping <laughs> her own blood away. We should probably take a minute. You're looking a little uh bloody. Damn good job though. You fucking you obliterated that guy. Oh, you know, I can, um, that's the, the sword, really. Mm, it's the wielder, too. She's I gonna don't... smile and just, like, take the compliment, not gonna argue. It's because she's tired. <laughs> Fair. Well, listen, disappears again. <laughs> what's going on with her? What's she, what's she doing? How do you keep doing that? I'm not actually going to, you know, keep rolling this for the like every six seconds for the next uh, period of time. <laughs> and, and thank you for the assistance. Amity sort of smiles and waves at a wall. Our lives have gotten very strange as of recently. All right. So these people were talking about, they thought we were strahd i think or 
Strahd's forces, maybe. Kept talking about the devil. Do you think they're just sort of like sitting there waiting for anyone and they sort of like an automatic response type thing? I don't know. They seemed intelligent. They fought reasonably intelligently, but it's hard to tell. They're they're smart. Revenants are real smart. They're effectively just people, just souls back in their bodies. Well, revenants then. Uh, so they ain't like zombies as they. They just like just smart zombies. When you die, and you've got a lot of hate in your heart, I'm talking a lot for somebody or something, not just in general. Sometimes your soul just sticks around until that person's dead. Well, maybe that person can't die, or maybe that person is undead in this case. Yeah. I'd guess, but that doesn't explain why they're not out there fighting him as opposed to jumping us. You'd think if there were folks Strahd had killed that were, you know, that powerful that they'd be out doing what we're doing. Well, maybe it's like ghosts, right? I mean, you remember back at uh, that house, you know, the house of death. Aerith uh, does a full body shudder. You know, they, the, those kids couldn't get out. You know, they, they were stuck there. Maybe it's like that. Maybe they're just bound to this place because of one reason of one reason or another. That's a good point, though. I've never heard of anything like that. It's just usually you got to get what you need to done within like I think it's a year. I don't know the texts or for once this is from personal experience, not academia. What do you mean? I mean that. The Thaeans wouldn't fucking stay dead. I don't know if it's just the fanaticism that some of their higher tier soldiers fought with or some foul magic, but sometimes we kill one of their arc wizards or something, and then a few days later we just get back up, blow up a morgue. That's We lost a good chunk of the city that way when they... Somebody got sloppy and didn't burn a corpse they should have. It's sick. Dev. He you pokes recognize. his head out and begins making his way forward, uh, glaring down at the heads. Aye. Yeah, do you, I mean, yo, do you recognize this armor at all? He looks at you blinking and then gives a sputtering laugh. Ha! <laughs> you fucking think... Look, lad, I may have one foot in the fucking grave, but I ain't that fucking old. No, I mean, you, you know, old, you know, uh, wizened, you know, uh, knowledgeable right. about things. Yeah. Nah, lad, he's look a fair fucking mile older than I. He kicks one of the heads and it rolls across the ground, landing face down in the puddle. Amity, what were you saying about... A battle that they couldn't escape? I'm not sure. So, in my dream, one of them said they were fighting a fight against an enemy, but that it would never be won or, or lost. And the, the big dragon um, wanted me to free them. I, do you think freeing them means what we just did? Or is it something else? They'll be back. I can't see that being freed. And wait, they said Order of the Silver Dragon. They mentioned that. Yeah. Can't be a coincidence, right? No, I mean, that's a big old dragon out there. So, and the what we saw in the parlor. There's some strange happening here, but... If what Amity's dream said is right, and, like, these knights can be turned to our side somehow, then... Then we'll... I mean, it took the nine of us a good bit of effort to take down three of these. If there used to be an order of these, and they're, they've stuck around to fight, then... 
Straw won't know what hit him. Or possibly he will. He will very much know what hit him. <laughs> Maybe the reason they stuck here is because of him. Maybe. Then, But you'd think we would have heard of if they'd been out fighting him, right? I mean, not even Dev knows what the fuck they are, and you know, he's a thousand years old. Rude. He shoots you a glare, snorts, but does not bother to reply. Lillison wanders over here and looks at the, uh, the fog pouring in. Do you think they were physically constrained to this place? I don't know enough to know. Ah, I hope we are stuck in this place now. I mean, if it's like that, that house, you know, we found a body of some kids. Maybe, maybe their bodies is here too and they just need to be, you know, I don't know, interred or whatever. If it's like that house, I think we have significantly better odds this time around. Well, I hope all the doorways don't just start uh, trying to cut us up into little ribbons then. We try to leave. Uh, right. I don't need another thing like I have on the balcony. My back the doorway fair. behind Metreon suddenly uh, closes. What? Fuck. <laughs> what Ambie, the uh, Ambi titters. <laughs> That was just a was just a prank. It opens it back up. Uh, you know I mean, what? Say, no, you don't see anything immediately, prank. but you do see blinking toward the doors. Uh, actually, uh, Amity, you're they they can't see anything, right? Uh, no. Gotcha. You just see the doors swinging open and closed on their own. All right, this, this is not the place to be pranking. Uh, yeah, what do we sorry, want to do? That was bad taste. It's fine. Uh, How about we take a moment, find a secure chamber, or go outside, rest, and then go upstairs? How much do we think uh, Metreon points towards the doors that Kiva's near? Do we think there's uh, more spiders in there? Definitely more well, spiders in there. I opened it. No, that's oh, right. Okay. So, so maybe we go to the chapel and, and rest in there? Less Unless instances. you think they're going to come back? Lots of windows in this chapel, and... Uh... Lillison sends forth her mage hand to open the door directly to her north. Uh, you see that it is barred, uh, but I guess you can lift the bar easily enough with your mage hand if you'd like. I would like. All right, it clatters to the ground and you peer out beyond, uh, seeing what looks to be... You can't make out many of the details from here, but you see what looks to be a mist-strewn graveyard at the other end of stone stairs leading down into the earth. There appears to be a graveyard here, so if we wish to avoid further undead... Perhaps this is not the best place. Yeah. Uh, the best place would be uh, a room I don't think we're going to be using. Barrel room, you think? Yeah. One entrance. It's behind a secret passage, but we'll find something else. I mean, as if you want, we can kick, uh, we can kick Van Richten out and just uh, take that room. She looks at you and snorts. <laughs> it's a funny thought, but I don't think that'll be necessary. There, as far as we can tell, as long as we have access to this uh, main concourse here, and she gestures toward the uh, doors for the north and south, I think that we should have an ample opportunity for escape from several uh, angles. Uh, if we want to put up store in the barrel rooms, that might not be a bad idea, but uh, if we want to have more freedom of movement, there is also this chamber itself. It seems, well, easy enough to retreat if need be. I suppose we should be more worried about retreat than choke points. You make a... Alright, yeah, no, I'm alright with that. Yeah, I'm keen on it. I wanted to take a look at all this furniture anyway. Have you seen the carving on some of these chairs? Davian grunts and you see he's looking at one of the rather lifelike statues in the southern alcove and just paying you zero attention. Hmm. Uh, we fight a bunch of ghosts and it's the furniture you're talking about. Alright, well... Look... We've seen a lot of ghosts, but very little interesting furniture so right. far. I can get go. I can walk into the woods and get ghosts. Metreon sits down, uh, kind of near uh, Kiva, um, just watching the, uh, turning his head between the the different exits, just making sure that nothing is coming or going. 
As yes. you're doing that, Ismark will uh, glance toward uh, Amity. Would you mind giving me a hand with this? And he uh, lays a hand on the table. I figured that we could probably use it as a decent barricade to some of the doors, if need be. Oh, that's a great idea. It's a little smashed. Um, yeah, Amity will help him uh, rig the table up, along with maybe some of the chairs. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, wh which doorway would you like to put them in? Ismark's happy to move it wherever. Uh, asking the rest of the party, are we most scared of the spiders or something else in here? Spiders. Yeah, spiders. All right. And uh, with Amity's help, uh, the two of them move the remains of the table and some of the chairs to form a makeshift barricade uh, the southern doorway toward the spider's chamber. Yeah. Actually, we don't know what's to the north yet, do we? I suppose we should check that. you mind doing the honors? Lillison stands we have behind to? the uh, barricade of everybody <laughs> and uh, <laughs> may chance the door open. Okay. You peer through the door. Uh, you see what looks to be Arthur Peering through the opening, you see a kitchen that has been plundered. It's tables overturned. Uh, you can see the floor is littered with rusted utensils and smashed crockery. Narrow windows flanking a hearth look out over the cemetery, and an open iron pot hangs from a hook inside the blackened fireplace. The pot rattles on its hook and bobs up and down as though something is inside of it. Oh, God. All right. Weapons, everybody. There is a floating soup pot in here. Oh, come on. Yeah, that's a my what? pot. A, it's, it's flying around. It's not flying, it's it's sitting on its hook, but it's rattling and oh. moving from side to side, shaking there's, rather violently. There's some in this soap pot. I'm a... Lillison, you mind tipping it over? Lillison uh, excuses herself as she walks between Ismark and Irina. Uh, opens the second door with Mage Hand. And then very carefully with her mage hand, um, is it too heavy to lift off the hook? Uh, I would say no. With your mage hand, you can, with some exertion, lift it from its hook. All right. She very carefully lifts the pot off its hook and then rolls it onto its side so that the lid comes off. As it's... There is actually no lid. It's opened uh, to the surface. And as you disturb it with your mage hand, kind of pulling it off the hook hear the flapping of leathery wings and you see flying out from the interior a small black bat that squeaks faintly and begins flapping around the upper part of the room. Kill it! And I'm gonna walk up and firebolt it if I can. Okay, go for it. Wilson leans away from the firebolt. <laughs> uh... No, I'm. <laughs> you know what? Yes, that's a twenty. A Three. twenty will certainly hit. Uh, for uh, seventeen points of fire damage. There is a final <laughs> uh, squeak from the small uh, bat's body before the rolling blast of fire rolls out to engulf it immolating the entire thing and scorching away its wings. Its squeak immediately dies as its tiny body falls to the ground, flames curling across its fur. Well, that was a close one. I am getting real sick of having to worry about tiny animals. Well, listen, gently closes the doors again. Oh, wait, 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 hold on. Uh, and Metron just wants to do a quick scan of the room to see if any of the rusty cutlery is in fact silver uh sure give me an investigation check nine nothing that you could tell it just seems to be old you know mostly rusted you know decay uh old you know pewter and tin all right now you can now you can close it damn seems like this place has been ransacked not surprising i guess but still it's a hell of a thing So what are we doing? Just sitting here? I think so. For the moment. Let Kiva let Kiva's wounds heal. Let the rest of us get back. A little bit of juice. Do what we can. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Anyone up for right, cards? Sorry. Are y'all taking a short rest? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I would play a round or two of cards. All right. I think the P pulls out the deck he got from the Durst house. Now I'll warn you, I have a terrible poker face, but... Or do oh, I? I've noticed. The... Shut up! Just deal. But it, there's a smile as he says it. And yeah. We rest. We rest. All right. If there's anything you'd like to do during this short rest, let me know. Otherwise, as the mist curls across the floor and beyond the windows of the cemetery beyond, you occasionally hear uh, what seems to be the distant creaking of timbers, the uh, ancient groaning of the old structure, and once or twice what sounds like a whispering on the wind that soon vanishes into nothingness. But despite a general sense of eeriness that pervades the experience, your short rest passes uneventfully. Um, I've got, it, I've during the got short rest, I'm oh, sorry, you go first, Patreon. No, you go first. Okay. Um, Amity will sort of be like, uh, does anyone want some uh, background music? Like, basically, is, is anyone planning to spin hit dice here? Kiva think... definitely is. Cool. Um, I would do Song of Rest. The thing is that Amity doesn't actually want to take a short rest. Can she still do a Song of Rest without short resting? Sorry, this is such um, a weird question. <laughs> what's the exact question again? Can Amity do Song of Rest? So you can use soothing music or oration to help revitalize your wounded allies during a short rest without actually taking a short rest. Because for complicated spirit tales reasons, it's she would prefer not to reset the currently active spirit the, tale. But she's uh, got to be doing strenuous activity to not be resting. <laughs> she could jog she around the like room. <laughs> the easier thing, too, is that Kiva can lay on hands herself, and that way we can save it. That oh, way I don't okay. have to spend hit dice. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I, I'll just do that. I, 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 I would say that, uh, Amity, if you'd like, um, it, it's, you know, any allies who hear your performance, so you don't have to take a short rest yourself. Cool. The memes. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, also, while everybody is uh, sitting around and resting, um, um, Lillison glances around and says, Something has been on my mind. L- languages. When I was um, trying to express what was going on without letting any of his spies potentially hear, I found it difficult to determine which language would be best. What languages do you all know? Well, I mean, I kind of know common. Uh, I was kind of talking this weird guttural voice that sometimes makes sense to me. Uh, I I don't know what it means quite, but I I know what it means, but I don't, don't know how I know it. Out of game, what language is that, Earthrim? Is that Metreon? Infernal. Earthrim oh, turns Infernal. back and says, what did he say? And he, he, say? Uh, he says, uh, I'm really sick of this place. I want to leave. Earthrim Deer suddenly perks up. Very much the same. Which he says in the same sort of guttural cadence. Yeah, and he's like, I, I know this place sucks, but like also in the same. Uh, well, you, you, you understood it, then. Uh, yeah, that's Infernal. Oh, uh, well, I guess that makes sense. Huh, so it's not, wait, so it's, he kind of looks between the two tieflings. So is it not some y'all had to study? It's just some you know? I just, I just always talked it, and it always made sense to me. Uh, some other folks seem to, to, it made sense to them too, but uh, never really asked why. Yeah, I mean, same here. Inferno's kind of a judgy name. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Is there some... <laughs> oh no, it's not you. Well, I suppose that's one thing answered, at least for the three of us. Boy, I never thought that, I never thought that class would come in use. Lillison is listening to all of this, like, wide-eyed and with rapt attention. He switches back to common. Well, we've got one. We've got one language in common, at least, which Strahd may or may not know. I don't know. I know it, and he's had 
five hundred more years to study. I know um, Elvish and Sylvan and Carmen, and I can recognize Thieves Cunt when I see it, but I, I can't understand it myself. Hmm. Yeah, I got same. Common, Elvish, a little bit of Sylvan from my dad, and, well, that. Uh, gnomish, but I've only seen it written, so I'm not exactly sure on the pronunciation. Hmm. So if we need Mi some communicate, or er, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, Metreon uh, looks at Lillison and taps on the uh, the wall in Thieves' Camp. Uh, get a load of these, get a load of these losers. And Lillison looks over Kiva at her. Looks and her eyes. She doesn't know what I said. <laughs> oh no no no! I know she's wounded that you're not. You oh, offered to translate it, yeah. thieves camp for her, and you still haven't done it yet. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah, I forgot about that. We'll do that. Make a note of it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool if my a teacher though. Yeah, Lillison just kind of rolls her eyes at Matrion and then looks over at Amity and says, "Yes, there are several languages that I've only really seen." written and no matter how good a pronunciation guide is it's not really the same no not quite although so it doesn't seem that we have anything super in common though right like no, not one that but... any all of us can speak no but we do have a possibility here since i know both sylvan and infernal we if we presume that most folks aren't going to know either of those, then if we need to communicate some between the five of us, we can use me as a bridge. That's a good crossover. Uh, what about Ez and Irina and Ismark and all them? Davian and the other NPC, sundry NPC. Ez <laughs> 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 rolled up and an eyebrow uh, and holds up her hands uh, as if in self-defense. Hey, I just speak Elvish over here. I spent a lot more time on the uh, dusty old tomes of uh, uh, things that sh should probably be dead. Uh, not over much on linguistics. Uh, ah, but, so you uh, learned Begin to regret that now. Indeed. Uh, that's all I know, but it's, you know, common, of course. Uh, and she looks toward the others. And as Mark looks briefly troubled, I'm go. I mean, I, all I know is, you know, the, the language I speak, I'm going to assume that by the way you're talking, it's you call it common? I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, I suppose it's more relevant in a world where there's actual significant species crossover. For you, it's just what people speak. Yeah. Davian just snorts. I speak what everyone else speaks. Ain't having an opportunity or an occasion to need anything else. I am uh, curious that your ver that your version of common hasn't split off into another language, though. If y'all been isolated for this long, I'd think there would at least be fascinating. He shrugs, uh, and then looks toward Irina, who looks a little bit shy. I do speak uh, common, but um, I speak a little bit of um, uh, another language. Um, I picked it up. Uh, I used to go to the church sometimes, uh, uh, just to, uh, I like to read the books that they had there. Uh, I picked up a few words, uh, um, it wasn't a, I don't really know what, uh, the language is called, but it, it, uh, it, there was a lot in it about prayer and about divinity and things like that. And I'm not sure exactly what it was about, and I know it's not entirely useful, I'm sorry, but I know, I, I don't think it was... I think it was another language. There's no language you can know that wouldn't be useful until every person and every book that held it is burned and gone. That's that's really cool, Irina. Thank you. Uh, I, I spent a while trying to decipher it, and uh, I think, I mean, I, I can't know the accents right, but there is a bit of pronunciation, so I kind of worked it out over a few different books, but, you know. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I figure we gotta figure that he knows, like, you know, the most common languages. So that'd be what? Common, uh, Elvish, uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, Halfling, Dwarvish, Gnomish, anything yeah. else that we think? Uh... I mean, he's he's kind of evil, so maybe he speaks some evil, evil languages. I don't know. I know that he knows Abyssal uh, better than I do. 
Um, you, you know Abyssal? Yes, a bit. Oh, that's awesome. I've always wanted to learn, but can never find any decent books or decent teachers. They're, um, quite unsettling, even the beginning primers. Oh, so, uh, is, un so is Infernal, believe me. I can very easily believe that. Um, I don't know whether he might know Draconic or Dwarvish or Goblin, but neither do any of you, so hmm. that's a bit moot. So our best bet might be Sylvan, because that's very elf-specific. Yeah. All right, that, so we'll keep it to oh, we'll keep it to Sylvan, then, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, until we have Infernal confirmed, we could probably use that too. I wouldn't mind getting to learn a little better, especially as a he just blushes and looks over at Amity before looking away. <laughs> we could also make up our own language, like pajama means everyone attack suddenly. Amity, I am not making a con lang here. I am. <laughs> Out of character, can we make a con line? Because I would love to do that. I, you know. <laughs> although some good, like, Second. although actually, yeah, some good freight words and phrases that we could communicate with each other. But that's long-term stuff. Good idea, though. Hand signals oh, or some. Yes, it would be uh, much easier, for example, to shout things out in the middle of combat without alerting everybody that we're fighting to what we're doing as she very carefully does not look towards Erythrindir, uh, very clearly not thinking back to uh, episode four. <laughs> <laughs> and hold on, let me roll inside. I've gotten better. I'm just saying that coded commands are uh, a very common thing. It's some to look into, but probably later. I think we're going on an hour. Yeah, I feel like a haunted house isn't maybe the best place to figure these things out. Uh, but speaking of haunted, though, and you know, maybe it's uh, maybe it's the setting, maybe it's the uh, the fact that I'm three fourths out of the way of my wine uh, and uh, desperate for more. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bit sneaky. Maybe uh. Maybe I could do this, and uh, Mitron shrugs a bit and tears away this flesh from his, starting from his scalp and pulling it down uh, off of his face and off of his chest. And as soon as he re uh, removes the husk, uh, he turns into one of the revenants. Oh, I maybe, hate that. Maybe I can just, you know, uh, lead us. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that word. Maybe I could just be at the front, right? And then uh, if we do make the thing that's, uh, that's like this, and he gestures at himself, you know, maybe I can convince him that I'm one of them, and then you all sneak off and, you know, do the, do the thing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Although I do get the sense that whatever we find in here, we might need to talk to some of these if they're a bit less uh, horrible. I can talk in a very grim accent if you need me to. Hmm. Not bad. Thank you. Well, he Erythrindir shuffles the three dragon anti cards and puts them away. Shall we? We shall. Oh, this is hell in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you a nice right. lemon tea back in Balaki. Yeah, I guess your uh, short rest comes to a close, and as you'd like, you may stand yourselves up and resume as you wish. Uh, this is such a bad idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. So, uh, which way are we going? Up, down, left, I think right. Up. Well, there's a big staircase right in the main hall, so maybe we should try and see what's upstairs. Yep. Cautiously. All right. Um, so 
I guess if I'm doing this whole scouting thing, uh, I'll stay like 20 feet in front of the party and I'll just like try to be as sneaky as possible. Okay. Do you look like Metreon right now or human Metreon or? No, I look like a revenant, uh, but oh, like right, the right. most humanoid okay. looking revenant. Perfect. But a sneaky one. Yeah. And keep, no, keep the sun sword on like a dull roar, like the dim. Uh, the smallest you can make setting. it is fifteen foot. Like five, uh, is, 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 yeah, I think it's, it's a thirty foot radius. Is the smallest you can make it? Yeah. All right. Never mind. The revenants we just fought were they all like clanky as they came towards us? They were, you know. I mean, you could hear the clinking of their chainmail, like and like the rust of the joints of the of the armor, and you know, you could hear their footsteps as well. But, you know, it's not like they were wearing plate armor or anything. Okay. Uh, Little Sim will glance over towards um, their discarded arms and armor. And by discarded, I mean, like, on their dead corpses. Uh, and then back towards Metreon. But she'll just kind of pause and then shake her head. All right. I guess I'm going. This is so stupid. And, yeah, he will start to... Let's just scout ahead. All right, move yourself as you will. You're going through the chapel? Uh, yeah, we're going to go through the chapel and then go towards the staircase that leads up. Gotcha. Which I presume so, is the one on the, the north or the south? It's the north, right? Or the south. Um, so stepping into the chapel, you see you know, there are two spiral staircases, both leading up to the north and south. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing seems to descend to the ground. Uh, or to the underground, that is. Everything seems to go up. Um, and as your footsteps echo through the dusty, fog-filled chamber, you look up for a second uh, as you stand toward the altar, and you can see the hollow interior of a tower stretching up above you, staircases that seemingly emerge from a higher position uh, several stories up, uh, making their way, ringing the exterior of the tower before they vanish up to a uh, floor toward the very top. Do I do I hear anything coming up from up there? Make a perception check. Eighteen. Eighteen? You don't hear anything that, you know, seems to betray the presence of any creatures. Oi, can any of you uh it looks clear in here, but there's something up here. What do you mean by something? Oh no, there's a hole above here and there's something else up there. I can't really make it out now. Earth will squint into the gap. I would say, you know, you can see the very edge of from where Metron is standing. To really see up, you gotta be near the altar. Alright, he'll step back onto there. Carefully avoiding the shattered glass. Glancing up from your current position, uh, you can see uh, a lower landing around 60 feet up then a spiral staircase going around the edge of the tower, leading up to another landing, another 20 feet above, and then the staircase vanishing up through the floor of a higher level of the tower, out of sight. Okay, this, uh, this place is... I couldn't tell from the ground, but this place has got a fair few floors. We're gonna be climbing a bit. Looks like there's a roof or something. I mean, obviously, but like, uh, this goes pretty high. Does anyone know, here know how to fly? Anyone got wings? Truffle, you got wings? Um, I did not bring Truffle to the spooky haunted mansion. Sorry. Oh. Aww. That must have just been Ismark oinking. Uh, <laughs> Dev, you got any ideas? He shrugs. Looks like there's a bit of stairs up there. I reckon that... Uh, Sooner or later, we'll come to a door we can walk through. Yeah, probably seems like the ticket. DM, would I be able to use any of the pillars in the chapel to climb up and then climb into the hole? So the pillars around you don't go up to the hole. Rather, looking up, they rise to a U-shaped balcony up, up that would appear to be on the second floor of the manor that looks down upon the altar below. And then oh, above them, you know, there are walls that lead up, but, you know, there's not really a, yeah. uh, a pillar that leads up into the hole. You're just, yeah, okay, you're standing beneath a, a balcony right now. Okay, that makes sense. All right, well, uh, itty, meeny, monimo, and uh, 
catch a tugboat. He ends up pointing at south at the end of the Eeny Meeny Miny Mo, and he's going to go ahead and head that way. Why would you want to catch a tiger? Because <sighs> if he hollers, you'll let him go. All right, and uh, just so you know, uh, foundry teleports are set up. So if you'd like to ascend the stairs yourself, you will be moved appropriately. Oh, I'll do that. Ooh. That's pretty great. Oh, work. This is great. Yeah, I love that. All right, so Metreon, as your footsteps echo through the dusty stone steps, you emerge to find uh, a new space at the very top of the landing. You see, uh, as you pass through the narrow windows that allow dim light entering this five-foot-wide staircase, you emerge uh, onto the balcony itself, looking down. Uh, from here, you can see that, obviously, this overhangs the mansion's chapel. You can see an ex exquisitely char carved wooden throne resting at the west end between two doors and narrow archways leading to the spiral staircase from which you came. Hanging from the high ceiling, you see an iron chandelier with candle holders shaped like tiny silver dragons. And across the way, you see Kiva, uh, her own boots uh, thudding through the dust as she makes her way up the northern staircase across from you. Glancing down, you can still see uh, Esmeralda, Davian, and a few others uh, remaining down in the lower levels of the chapel. Really love good motif here, don't I? Uh, well, Kiva, you check that door, I'll check this one. Yeah, Kiva will... Um... Take a moment to look at the throne to see if there's any sort of like gilded or jewel shaped things in it. And if not, she'll just open the door right away. Yeah, looking at the uh, throne, it doesn't seem to have anything in it. Just a, a very elegantly carved wooden throne of what seems dark oak, perhaps. It's very nice. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen at the door first to see if I hear anything before I open it. <laughs> oh, okay, oops. Kiva it. just opened it right away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kiva peers outside to the space beyond. Um, immediately, you just see a kind of uh, V-shaped intersection with a uh, corridor leading to the southwest and another leading to the northwest. Um, you can see a door immediately across you from you as well on the slanted uh, angle of the far wall. Seems quiet. Just a hallway and another door. Uh, Metreon, anything? Uh, yeah, with a 13, do I hear anything behind the door? Uh, you do not hear anything behind the door. Very carefully open it up. Uh, no, it just looks like a looks like this is an intersection. From where Lillison is standing now, can she look through this window and through the other window across and see uh, what is currently being revealed on the map? Yes, she can see like what seems like a kind of a wrecked uh, debris strewn room. She can't like quite see the floor as well, but she can see what seems like a ruined uh, wardrobe through the window across the way. Uh, given your passive perception, I would say that you can see that. Okay, she's going to call softly ahead. Metreon, take care if you open any of the doors to the left. There's uh, quite a bit of wreckage there. Right, yeah. Uh, DM, what's this down here at the uh, lower uh, right? Uh, so looking around you, you emerge, you see a door across the way uh, to your right side, and on the left, you see what seems to be a small alcove with a curtain, uh, sorry, a red velvet curtain hanging across from the alcove in the southeast corner of the hall. The curtain, uh, actually, as you pass across it, ripples ever so slightly. Behind it? Uh, Metreon will... Uh get to the other side and as people start to filter in uh, like he'll see Ismark coming through the door and he'll hold his hand up and he'll put it, point his thumb towards the curtain and he's going to take out his, one of his daggers uh, his, and he's going to use the tip to try and draw the curtain to reveal what's behind it all right. As Mark stands at the ready, uh, one hand on the hilt of his longsword as the other one holds the short sword at the ready, you pull the tattered velvet curtain aside with your dagger, revealing what lies beyond. What lies beyond? Beyond, you see a black cloth covering something atop a white marble pedestal. 
Uh, Randy, Amity. What's up? There's something in here. Uh, want to use who can uh, detect him, the magic kind of stuff. Uh, have a look at this. That'd be Amity. Does Amity detect any magic as she moves next to Metreon? Uh, looking around and trying to detect magic, um, you do see a glimmer of illusion magic from below the black cloth. Yeah, there's some kind of illusion happening. We'll get your hand in here. Um, I, I guess if it's just an illusion, um, Amity is going to pat the cloth to make sure it's real and then lift it. Uh, okay. okay. Oh, sorry, are you getting your hand in there or are you asking me? No, no, no. Lilith can try. Oh, Lilithson. Oh, right. That's better. Oh, I didn't hear that. Yeah, uh, Lillison will s cautiously move over, although she does give the throne a very curious look as she does. And uh, she will send her mage hand forth. All right. You grasp the mage hand with your uh, skeletal mage... Uh, sorry, you, black you grasp the cloth with your skeletal mage hand and just kind of tease the cloth, pulling it away. And as soon as you begin to you see a bit of reddish liquid staining the bottom of the top of the pedestal, and in a blink you see the black cloth is fully pulled away. And looking over what lies below, you see a head staring toward you, eyes blank and wide, mouth very slightly ajar, showing small fangs between the teeth, hair falling over the ears, uh, over a headband, gray silver locks covering pinkish flesh and a ragged gray beard as you see bits of flesh and sinew blood dribbling down the sides of the pedestal as Metreon's severed head stares blankly up at you from its place Metreon stumbles back uh, falling against the, the wall behind him what the fuck is that the fuck is that it, it, an illusion Probably. Earthendeer grits his teeth, and he just raises his wand. Oh no, you don't. I am sick of this fucking place. And he is going to cast a spell magic on the illusion. Okay. You do so, and the illusion immediately winks out, vanishing and leaving in its place an exquisite alabaster bust of a handsome middle-aged human with a neatly trimmed mustache and beard. Not a drop of the blood remains. It's not real. It's just more tricks from the, for this place. And it's not going to happen to yet anyone. Metreon goes over and just immediately, using his boot, kicks it over and tries to kick it off the, uh, the pedestal. You have to reach up a little ways away. The pedestal isn't that close to the ground, but you manage to kind of give it a shove with the side of your boot. The bust teeters and then falls, crashing and smashing on the ground as uh, bits of alabaster go uh, spilling across the flagstone floor. Or not flagstone, uh, actually this part is wood. There's like kind yeah. of a sickening crunch of splintering wood as it impacts the floor and goes smashing into a thousand pieces. He'll spit down on it and uh, he'll head back out. And uh, he'll keep scouting ahead unless Kiva is going in a different direction. Yeah, Kiva would go through um, the opposite, the door that she was at, and sort of head down that hallway as well. Okay. Okay, as Metreon steps away, the curtain falls back in its place, covering the place where the bust once sat. Oh, Wilson winces Kiva, a little bit you... and uh, glances to Erythrindir and says, Do you think anything heard that? Almost certainly. Well, I'm keeping this cloth. You should. It's pretty. Kiva, as you step out into the hall, you see the door to your left closed, and to your right, a red velvet curtain hanging in front of an alcove in the northeast corner of this hall. Ooh, um, feels like two bad decisions are awaiting Kiva. Um, let's try this door first, and then try the curtain second. Okay. 
If you'd like, you can open and take a peek. Looks like a bunch you of water. You peer through, and you see rainwater seeping through cracks in the ceiling where they it flows into a pool on the sagging wooden floor. The pool fills about half the room. Bare stone shelves line the walls. As you put a toe forward, you feel that the wooden floor is soft and spongy. Ooh, uh, yeah, she'll get out of there and shut the door behind her and just say that the floor is probably not stable. Um, and then go over to the curtain and, uh, you know, like, very gently push it aside slowly, just waiting to see if something horrible jumps out. Okay. You pull open the curtain uh, as it slides uh, on its uh, pole lodged in the place of the stone over your head. Uh, pulling it aside to reveal an empty stone alcove with narrow windows in the back walls that look out over a gloomy cemetery. Nothing of note. She takes like a very <laughs> like slow exhale because she's just so full of panic. Um, and then she'll just keep going down the hallway. One thing you do notice looking through is you can just faintly see the top of a large stone building in the uh, in the cemetery uh, that rises about a story or so. And looking at you can see uh, what seem to be stone gargoyles shaped like dragons perched on top of the roof, looking out in the cardinal directions. Does it seem like a like a mausoleum in the graveyard? It looks like it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. She would call back to, um, none of her party is on this side of the hallway with her. Um, she would call over to Erthrandir, uh, or whoever is on the other side, and just say that there looks like a mausoleum in the graveyard. Um, and that might be a tomb where a guild member is, you know? Oh, shoot. All right. Yeah, let's look at that once we get back downstairs. Thank you. Or anything else over there? Uh, nothing but a rotting floor and an alcove of nothing. I'm gonna keep going, uh, this way. Alright, be careful. Kiva, as you step forward, you see two stone balconies flanking the main foyer, and looking down, you can actually see the great hall in which you first entered, and the great double doors leading out into the front of the mansion. You can see balusters carved to resemble knights in shining armor supporting their elegantly carved stone railings. Weapons and shields festoon the walls along each of these walkways, while alabaster busts of handsome men flank hallways that lead north and south away from the foyer. At the west end of each balcony, you see an archway that leads to a spiral staircase going up, and to your immediately left, the grand staircase that leads down to the main floor. Kiva just Metron, as you pass by the southern entrance to the entrance of the southern corridor, you feel almost as though the eyes of the stone busts are silently watching you. I don't like that. What 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 is this place? What is this place doing to him? Um, yeah, he sees uh, that and obviously is unnerved. But also, he's looking down into this uh, this corridor that looks to be uh, broken off. Yes, the corridor just ends at a ragged bit of floor that spills out over the southern side of the mansion. Uh, it's almost as though a large part of it has been torn away or worn away over the years. Uh, it's uh, a rather unnerving sight. He takes a moment. There's a door at... opening to the left side of the hall. Yeah. Uh, so he takes a moment looking out on the uh, the open fields of Barovia uh, before uh, entering into this room. Uh, does he see anything of note other than just debris? Looking around, you see debris uh, across the floor. As you do, you know, kind of peering inside, uh, you see, you know, a lot of debris through the area. The south end of the room has collapsed, exposing the chamber itself to the elements. You can see a few furnishings lie being broken under fallen debris from the level above. If you'd like, you can take a look around and explore further. Uh, you see, you know, looking all around, you know, it seems to be pretty abandoned. There are a few uh, webs strewn about on the side of the southern end. Hey, so you're taking a look around and exploring? Yes, yes. Uh, I rolled an 8 on investigation. Okay. You take a look around, uh, pouring over the broken debris, the wooden floorboards creaking under your weight. You kind of kind of disappointedly glance through a large pile 
of debris on the northern side, kind of looking to see if there's anything of value. With a bit of disgust, you turn away. And then you see a large shadow overcasting you. Eight massive legs. No! Looming over you as this massive carapace body rears atop you and immediately lunges forward with its mandibles. I look like a revenant, though. Uh, you do. That's a personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, 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 I will need, uh, uh, I will say just for the sake of the first round of combat, uh, let me just do a quick stealth check for these boys. Metron, what's your passive perception? Uh, oh god, I don't know. Why are you 10 plus your me? perception mod. Uh, yeah, uh, it is 11. Alright, that does not beat a 17. Uh, as you see immediately the silhouettes of two massive spiders leering over you, and then each of them spits a thick, sticky web all across your form. That is an 11 to hit. It does not hit. And surprise gives advantage, right? Or is it just you uh, act first? Yes, I believe it does. All right, and a 15 to hit. A 15 does hit. Okay. Uh, with that, Metron, you turn and immediately you're wrapped, wound by a uh, thick spider's web. Almost the cords themselves, almost as wide as half of your forearm, wrapping around your torso and locking your arms and legs to your sides, you are restrained, though your mouth is still free for the moment. Survive uh, does not give advantage. Oh, you're awesome. right. No, it's it just... Uh... Thank you. So, Metron, anything you would like to do? Uh, so, as that... Uh, let me just double-check something, actually. Uh, yes, so as that uh, spider flings its sticky sticky web at me, uh, I, I guess it essentially pins me to the wall, restraining me, but as it does, uh, it just adds a reaction. Uh, his body just gets warm again with that uh, white flame, and he's going to go ahead and cast Hellish Rebuke on these things. Yeah! Uh... Uh, I'm actually going to need you to roll initiative for that because if you're surprised, you don't have a reaction. Oh, you're right. I don't have a reaction. You're right. Damn. So, I mean, you still get to roll initiative to see if that works. So just roll me a d20 and we'll fix your initiative later. Ooh, natural 20. So that's going to be uh, 22. All right, yeah, you go first. All right, yes, yeah, so I'm going to blast it with that uh, that Hellish Rebuke, so they need to make a... The one that spit at me uh, and successfully got uh, me in the web needs to make a dex save. Hellish Rebuke has to be triggered by damage. Oh, oh damn, does right. That's yeah. unfortunate. In that case, no Hellish yeah. Rebuke. I'm sorry. No Hellish Rebuke for me. But I I am, I guess, first to act. Uh, is there anything that I can do to try and escape this? Uh, perhaps. Is there anything you wish to do to alert your companions? Any sound you make? Oh, yeah. Well, as a free action, I'm screaming bloody murder. Okay. Uh, Everyone hears, uh, hears Metreon screaming bloody murder. And with that, we are in an issue. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to fight spiders. I don't want to do this. 19. 19. Hey. 23. There we go. 16. I thought we were going to get through Argy without fighting these. I had a hope. <laughs> you tried. Um, yeah, Alright, Can you change my uh, initiative? Uh, yes. What did you roll? 20? It should be 22. Yeah. Alright, uh, Kiva, you are up first. You hear Metreon absolutely screaming bloody murder from the southern side of this floor. What are you doing? All right, she is going to run down and up the staircase and get to the other side. All right. Uh, 
And then let's see what I can do. Because paladins don't get spell slots back on short rest. All right, so what's up? Uh, you do see one massive spider clawing its way up the southern end of this corridor that you are now entering. Fuck. I it immediately catches sight of you and clacks its mandibles hungrily in your direction. As you hear the hissing uh, okay. uh, sounds of two others in the room to your left. All right, she's going to... Um... Hmm... I choose to do two bonus actions instead of doing an action. Like, is that possible? No. Oh, boo. Okay. Um. All right. Then she's just going to um bonus action rage and see what happens on the wild table and but um and then use her action to dash and get up closer to the spider. Okay, go for it. And let us see what the rage gift is. Sorry, my computer's crawling at a snail's pace You're today. Good. Uh, so that's a one. Ooh, okay. Um, so there's like, I'm going to describe this because it's never happened before. Um, as Kiva runs up on the spider, there is this like explosion of mist that comes out of her uh, mouth and eyes and sort of swirls around her body and the body of the spider and I need it to make a constitution saving throw. That is unfortunately a natural 20. Fuck. Okay, that's fine. Um, so it doesn't matter because I still get temporary hit points. So we'll just see. Uh, I hope no one comes near me. That's a hint for this pretend being a problem if you have low constitutions. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Uh-huh. All right. This, so this could be dangerous for other people. <laughs> okay. So, there's what this like uh, mist spilling around you. What does it look like exactly? Is it is it visibly dangerous to others? Um, it looks like the mists of Ravenloft. Like it's very, it's it's like that. That sort of, um, and it feels not necessarily like the exhaustion of the mists, but it has a similar sort of vibe that it's like creeping and, and wants people inside of it. Gotcha. And what's the radius on that? 30 feet. Uh, oh, shit. You can choose Around what creatures her. get affected by that. Each creature of my choice that I can see. So, yeah. Yeah, um, just me know. yeah but <laughs> just be careful. <laughs> I guess if she can't okay. see you, I don't know. All right, with it's that, turn is up. Metra, and you are stuck to the back wall in sticky uh, spider web. What are you doing? Oh, there are two yeah. of them approaching you now. What's up? Yeah, as I continue to scream, uh, I do intone, uh, using the word shit, uh, my mirror image spell. So I'm going to go ahead and cast that. Okay. Three... Uh, Slightly decrepit looking images. I mean, you're a revenant now, so they mostly just resemble your current state with little change. Yeah, a bunch of revenants. Maybe a little yeah. more run down. But yes, uh, the, th the three illusory metrons appear around you. Uh, and as a bonus action, um, is it possible to try and hide in the webs and the debris? No. Sorry. <laughs> Worth a try. I respect the effort. Yeah. Um, then... Uh... Let me see if I have any other bonus action. Uh, no, I'm going to say that. Uh, yeah, that's my turn. All right, Erthrandir, you're up. All right. He hears the scream and he is off. Okay. You immediately see a corridor, Kiva at the other end, strewn with just uh, grayish mist that crackles occasionally with black tendrils that lance through it. She seems to be confronting a large spider at the other end and you... Uh, here, Metron continuing to scream from the left side door. Left from my perspective, from his Correct. perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, left from your perspective. Okay. In that case, he's going to hop over here, see these two, and just let out a grimace of... Wait, there's not a roof, right? Like, that's looking out into open air. That is looking out into open air. Excellent. They're just 
crawling from the bottom. I mean, there there is a roof as such, but like looking right. out on the south side, there is just empty space. Earthrim Deer looks to Metreon. All right, you can get out of this. I know you can. Just be careful. And he is going to give them bardic inspiration. And then he is going to close one eye, stick his tongue out of his mouth, carefully point his wand, and let a fireball lance out to a point in the air. All right, where are you placing it? Uh, let me show you. And I'm pl I'm positioning it slightly off the ground so that it's not going to, like, burn up the floor. Okay. So just kind of uh, the spheres reaching reaching down to hit him. Gotcha. Did you place the template? Yep. I'm not seeing it. Oh, oh there we go. All right, gotcha. I, yeah, I think that's perfectly doable. Uh, you see as this bright streak flashes from your finger, and then you hear Kiva, Metron, in the distance, the war drums, the trumpeting brass, and then bursts with a brilliant crescendo as the sphere of flame spirals outward, devouring the two spiders within. Uh, what's the damage on that? 26. All right, that is uh, the right one fails, the left one succeeds. Over right. here, both of them screeching in pain. Uh, oh, it hits the third one as well, right there in the uh, little purplish square. Oh, it does, because it worms around. I didn't even mean to do that. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, that's another success as well, so it takes half damage. But you do watch as, you know, there's this massive burst of flame uh, burning across the follicles of hair there. Uh, they seem not to enjoy this quite a lot as uh, you watch as the one on the right actually is just burned away to a crisp immediately. It's clawed legs falling away uh, and its body dropping over the edge from its weight as the floor splinters below it. Uh, the other two hissing and rearing back as they take 13 points of damage looking very wounded. Alright, that's his turn. Okay, Lillison, you're up. Uh, all right. Lillison moves 30. Uh, dashes another... Oh, goodness. Um, right. She is going to pause between Kiva and Erthrandir and, uh, you know, just... She, she looks like she's trying very hard not to just shut her eyes tight. Um, but she is going to puff forth a poison spray at the one right in front of Kiva. Okay. Con save, please. That is an eight. All right, that's 10 poison damage. All right, you watch as its figure kind of tenses for a moment. Uh, the eye is rolling as the whole thing sways slightly, almost like dribbling onto the ground, this kind of caustic-looking saliva. Uh, it is not looking great. That's my turn. Okay, Amity, you're up. Yeah, Amity's uh, rushing in. Oh, there it is, huh? There's, there's several of them. Okay. Um, Amity is going to use a little bit of a bonus action to try to push this spider back five oh. feet. Yeah. It would be cool if it fell. I'm just saying it would be cool. I think we would be too. <laughs> okay. Come on. This drink saving throw, please. Come on. All right. Let's see how it does. That's an 11. It's back five feet. <laughs> All right. You watch as the apparition of the knight appears before you, uh, bringing its shield forward and slamming ahead as it uh, moves the sword downward to dislodge one of the legs that's curled around the floor. The spider is sent violently back, its arms uh, waving almost comically in the air as it plummets over the edge and out of sight. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, and then Amity will... Uh... That's an extent of her movement, so she's just going to use vicious mockery. S see what happened to your friend? We aren't people you want to mess with. She's viciously mocking, ex super viciously, that spidey uh, over there to the right. All right, and as you do, Kiva, you hear a very sickening but satisfying crunch 
uh, and a total lack of any further so sound from the spider that fell. Whoa. And that is a 13 for the wisdom save. Only three damage, but disadvantage on its next attack roll. All right, very good. Thank you, Amity. And with that, as your turn ends, you hear the spider chittering again as it immediately rears back, turning away, and moves to crawl away under the ragged floor, vanishing into the space below. And then you can hear the distant shifting and swaying of the webs and the shifting of spider legs in the room below, but as you wait for a few tense moments, no further arachnid foes make any motion to appear. Metra, stop screaming, by the way. Has or has not? Has not. Ah. <laughs> Aerith will stride over and try and cut him out of it. And cut him out of the webs. Hey, we got you. We got you. <laughs> no, I'm not built for this. I'm not built for this. I'm not supposed to be up in front. I'm supposed to be behind. I'm supposed to be at the end. Get me out of here. Get me out of here now. He is going to get him out of there. And as Metron was saying that, uh, three others were saying that as well. I will say, I think that little trick means you're a bit more viable in front, but also I don't want to be staring down one of those things either, so I'm with you. I could make a really lewd remark about this whole situation, but I just want to get out of here. Hmm. You can always save it. Oh, uh, don't worry. And yeah, Metron and uh, his three amigos will start to follow. Uh, out of the horrible spider bedroom and meet the others. Lillison glances over to Amity and says, You know, it's not often that our enemies actually take good advice. <laughs> it is not. The others come rushing toward you, uh, Irina panting. Is everyone all right over here? What happened? Just the spiders. They were, uh, fine. They were fine. Oh, well, good grief. We've, uh, we've certainly become something these days, haven't we? Let's, uh, let's commiserate that later. Let's just try and find whatever the hell this place has for us. That isn't spiders or more revenants or ghosts or goblins or demons or griffins or whatever the fuck. Griffins would be nice. I'd always wanted to meet one. Yeah, it is real cute. I saw some of them in Waterdeep. They was real pretty. What? Oh, that's what's awesome. A, what's a griffin? It's like a... It's one of the... You know, it's like three different animals in one. I've only ever seen pictures. Is it true that it's like... Horse. A lion with wings and a big old eagle head. It, it, again, real pretty. Real oh. real big, though. Oh, uh, wow. The illustrator got them very wrong, then. Yeah, well, you yeah. know. All right, uh, where are we going? <laughs> um, uh, uh, you'll forgive me if I'm a bit shaken now. Uh, yeah. So if someone else can take point. I can. The illusory duplicates wink out. I think after that, we don't. We just stay together, period. <laughs> Like, not try and go down separate hallways. Then. All right. Yeah, Aerith will start stepping forward. He's going to carefully crack this door just south of him. Okay, you peer in and you see a similar room. The southern end is collapsed. It's just exposing it to the air beyond, and you know there's a few bits of debris here and there, but nothing of immediate notice. Anything of interest, or just a room? Make a perception check. Making a perception check. Seventeen. Nothing that you can immediately see, though you can certainly hear the spiders skidding around below you. Well, that is in fact of interest, but we're not worrying. We aren't worrying about them. He'll shut the door again. Just more ruined bedrooms this way. I think we might need to go upstairs. Upstairs or across, do you think? Uh, I don't know. Kiva, you were just across. What'd you see? Did you see anything over there? 
Well, I, I didn't really get very far on the other side because the spiders started attacking. So um, we can way, maybe then. check it out first and then head up. Yep. Good sense. Man, this place must have been lovely once. Like, I mean, obviously, years and water and giant spiders, but it's beautiful. I still can't quite make out whether it was meant to be a dwelling or a fortress, because the thing with, for example, that illusion, not the sort of thing you would want to have in, in your dwelling, really. I'd argue it's not the sort of thing you want in your fortress. You could poke your own eye out. As Marla glances toward you, looking thoughtful. There are some things that I have seen in my times. Uh, spirits, ghosts especially, those that dwell in the serial, can conjure effects that uh, make use of the weave in a certain respect. It's possible that it might not have been a spell as such, but something from beyond that could be interacted with in a similar way. Yeah. It's possible, but also the statue at the door... Do you think that was merely a parlor trick, or whether that was a, a true trap once? That had some juice behind it, or it did. I think I think it might have been both. House and good times, fortress and bad. All right, Arthur and Deer, stepping down the northern corridor as you pass between the two uh, stone busts, uh, you peer into this next chamber, and you see two beds with torn canopies lying against opposite walls with a tattered rug on the floor between them. Set into the far wall is a fireplace that's black with soot. A soft hiss issues from the hearth. We've got some sort of company, all coming from the hearth. Earth will instead of waiting for the mage and this time is going to step gingerly forward can he see what's making this sound when he's a little closer you kind of take a few steps in trepidation peering below to see anything that might appear untoward but as soon as you step within on the far end of the rug within the chamber you see a small puff of ash from within the fireplace and a small hissing, dra hissing dragon made of ash and smoke, erupts from the fireplace, filling the room with soot as it beats its wings. <laughs> it grows louder. Y'all, there's some in here. <laughs> Sorry, that was gross. As Muck peers over your shoulder, is everything... And as soon as you continue coughing, the smoky dragon, it spreads its wings, flapping them, and takes off into the air, flying swiftly out of the room over your shoulder, is Mark ducking back, his eyes wide, as it passes through the door. It veers sharply south, passing over Esmeralda and Amity's heads. Uh, just because I'm paranoid, uh, can I throw can I throw a firebolt at it? Uh, sure thing, if you'd like. Uh, it's gonna be a twelve. Twelve. That will hit. Roll some damage for me. Ooh, okay. I'll take that. Uh, it's going to be a 19 plus 3, so 22. All right. The bolt of flame sears through the air, crackling toward the smoky dragonette, and just disperses harmlessly across it as the ash consumes the heat of the flames. It continues southward, veering over Irina as she kind of ducks over, covering her head with her hands, Davian grunting, looking up at it with wide eyes as the smoky uh, small form veers westward over Kiva's head, passing along the balcony toward the spiral stairs. I think that's something we want to get. I think that's a message of some variety. <laughs> Probably telling us to get the fuck out, I would say. I mean, it looked like the dragon downstairs. The Did one that wanted us to... Dragon up there? I don't think I can handle a dragon. I think... I mean, I suppose it might have been one that, like, shapeshifted or something, but I think we would have seen anything of size from outside. You watch as the dragon it vanishes up the spiral staircase, making its way to the upper floors. It, it might have something to tell us. Or something yeah. to show us. Yeah, it doesn't seem hostile. Let's, let's, let's give it a try. 
way. Okay, alrighty. And Aerith will lead the, lead the gang up the spiral staircase. Are there teleports? There are indeed. Exciting. Ah! All right, so everyone making their way up the stairs toward the next floor. Passing upward as I prepare the next scene. You emerge Passing through this uh, staircase, you find yourselves facing a tattered black curtain that fills an archway before vanishing into the other side. Earth will wipe the last of his soot, blast of the soot from his face, and look to the others. I... you ready? Uh, no, but. I really don't think we have a choice then, do we? Yeah, I'll pull it aside. All right. You step through the curtain, glancing into the space that lies beyond. And you see beyond a simple corridor leading forth. Uh, you see to your left a pair of double doors leading to another chamber, and up ahead a pile of absolutely heaped rubble and debris, stone from uh, arch architecture piled with rotten timbers uh, laden with moisture uh, that seems to spill off from the southern side of the corridor ahead. At the opposite end, all the way on the other side, you see another pair of double doors leading to the left uh, across from another pair of doors leading to the south and east. Aerith will do as he's been doing and start cracking doors. Okay. Oh, goodness. You peer upward to the northern end of the chamber beside you. Uh, and looking into the area beyond, you see, through the dust and cobwebs, faded war banners adorning the walls of a spacious chamber, in the center of which stands a heavy wooden table. An iron chandelier hangs above the table, which is surrounded by six high-backed chairs with wood-carved dragons perched atop them. Slept in five of the chairs are skeletal humans in tattered chainmail. The corpses tilt their heads in your direction, and one of them growls. Why do you, the living, disturb the dead? And that's where we'll end it for today. Cool. We get to have Fun! brunch. Yay! Next time. Yay! Brunch with the boys! Boys, great. We. Oh yeah, the party might also uh, realize Lillison is not with them. <laughs> Again? Oh, boy. Exciting. She's doing this time. We will see what she's doing next time, I guess. Just uh, meeting with Strahd again. Yeah, yeah, totally. No biggie. He was he was Moving actually out. the bat that was stuck in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why'd you let him out? <laughs> Why wouldn't I let him out? Who let the Strahd out? Oh, my God. No. <laughs> All right, fine. I can see where I'm not wanted. Oh, you're wanted. Oh. oh. Well, in any case, thank you to everyone for joining us today. We will see you all back in the mists next week. Until then, don't fuck with spiders and take care.